Everyone hear me from the back? Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, sorry for today, like the projector wouldn't like get the audio from a microphone. So I'll, I'll try to speak a bit louder. I know like everyone's having like some form of sore throat. I have sore throat like last week as well. So I try not to like speak too loud, but uh, I hope this is okay for everyone. So yeah, good to see everyone this morning. Um, yeah, it's really like an uh, honor to be like in the, this presentation over here. You know, I just met up with like uh, Michael just last week and we just decided to do this because um, all the while I've been like thinking of like sharing this. Um, I was interviewing in the US about sometime last year or rather like in 2018, not last year. Right? Um, and you know, I went through like this uh, whole process of actually like finding out all the different things that's required, you know, in order to like uh, go through the interviews. Um, this is purely from my perspective in interviewing in the U.S. I'm not not everything might be applicable in Singapore over here. So take this with a bit of pinch of salt. Okay. This is my mouse. Okay, so. Over here, um, you, know, you guys are batch zero. This is my first time doing this. And I really want to like, um, yeah, I really want to emphasize though, this is the first time doing this and there might be like some hiccups and I hope to like do more of this in future. Okay, so um, week zero is basically what, we, what I plan to do um, like before the wholesale interview. So, um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about myself and you know, we'll see where this goes from here. Okay, so some background about myself. Um, so I graduated in 2011. Yeah, I know I'm kind of like old <laughs> over here. And I've been in the Bay Area for about eight years. I do mainly, um, you know, I do both like hardware and software stuff, but like a lot of what I do is mainly out of interest and it's more like, a, you, can, you can say it's a kind of a passion or hobby, right? Um, my day job is mostly in software, but if you go to my portfolio, throughout the presentation, there will be QR codes on screen. So feel free to actually like just go ahead and use your phone, scan, and you can like, open some links on your phone, right? Um, some of the links will be relevant to whatever I'm displaying on screen. And because like I chose a QR code because this is essentially a recorded session. So, you know, if anyone is not able to like attend this session today, right, you know, you're at home, you rewatch this a second time, a third time, you know, you can still access these links and you can't click on it because it's a video. Okay. Um, yeah. So I grew up in a time, right, where computers are not say very pleasant. Okay. Like in, in those days you have really huge boxes. There's no like nice looking MacBooks on your table. Right, these, these days everyone uses MacBooks, right? But computers in those days are like large or like in pieces because uh, in those days you find like computers from like either you buy them in parts or you salvage parts from multiple computers. And I really like grew up um, tinkering with these kinds of things. I'm, I'm not sure about you guys' experience with uh, computers, but maybe you have seen some of this in your workplace. Maybe you have some notion of this, um, you know, as you are growing up as well, some of you probably have used systems older than this, but like this is like a system, a single core these days, you have like multiple CPUs, right? And this is like, you know, you, you need to like add in many different cards for like video and audio capabilities, right? I, I didn't like grow up having a shiny Mac sitting on my table, right? Um, <clears throat> In those days, like these days, you guys like probably start off with like JavaScript or Python. Uh, can I know every, that's, what is the language you guys start off with? Like, any, how many of you start off with like Python? Can you have a show of hands. Okay. Um, how many of you start off with JavaScript? Okay, that's quite a few as well. Um, how many of you uh, started with like Java, like first language? Okay. So you guys like those with like Java or like some uh, you know, Java, probably like you started programming in school or something, right? Um, and, and in those days, like when you, when you code in like this kind of thing, you don't really have internet. So you have like a whole bunch of books. It's not as easy as you can do it today, right? You go on online, you are able to search. You have Stack Overflow. In those days, you don't have Stack Overflow. Right? These, these days, the viewers like, oh, you do something, hey, you go and Google it, right? <laughs> and, and many of the times like in, in development, you, know, you are able to read stuff and learn from others' experience because the internet is there for you to find out about stuff. Um, and back then, right, you know, when you're younger, everyone watched The Matrix, mm -hmm. right? So, so in those days, I think this is what right, really like, inspired me to like, do more computer-related things. Like, you, know, you have these guys surrounded by screens. You think like, oh, wow, it's so cool, right? So 
Anyone tried to do something like this before at home? Who has like more than one screen at home or your workplace? Who has two screens at home? Like raise, hey, raise our hands, someone like, don't, don't be shy, right? It's like, no one's gonna judge you for having more than one screen. Okay, at home I have five screens around me, that, that's fine. At work I have like three screens because one of the screens is like 35, 34 inches. Okay, so when I was young, right, these kind of things really like instills a, a kind of like passion in me, like, like this is cool, right? So you try to do it. When you try to do it, what happens? You, you, you went, when I was like in secondary school, you borrow like two laptops from school, and it's like, oh my God, I'm like the most advanced person over there, just because you have two laptops on the table, right? And you try, and, but you know, like this, this is what you actually end up with, and, and like, yeah, you know, very far from, this is what you, yeah, you actually end up with this, and you try to emulate what you see in the movies. So one of the first few, or I won't say first, I mean one of the programs I wrote, okay, in, uh, over here is, how do I play this? Can I move my mouse here? Where's my mouse? Yeah, it's, it's like a little program which emulates the matrix. I think this was back in like 2004 or you know, 2001, around there. <laughs> yeah, so it's just like, you know, a, a simple program that like moves characters up and down on the screen. It's very far from what the movie is, but you know, when you're young, you do these kind of things, it's useless, but you think it's cool, right? So you just do it anyway. Is this C matrix? Sorry? Is this C matrix? No, no, uh, it's just a program which moves green characters down the screen vertically. Normally when you write code, you look at a console window, it's horizontally, right? But if you're able to index every single position on the screen, I think in those days, DOS was like you know, 80 characters wide by 25 characters vertically. You're able to like move characters down the screen and you just think that's cool. I mean, like, you know, when you're like 16 or 18, yeah, those are the kind of things that you do. And I think it's good practice because it spurs you on, right? It gives you the kind of encouragement to show that if you can do this, what could you do when you are older, when you have more experience, right? And Okay, so this brings me to like why I'm standing here talking about this. The whole focus of this talk is non-technical. Right? I'm not going to tell you how to like answer whiteboarding questions. I'm not going to talk anything about close to whiteboarding, right? Because in the first place, like developers like myself, right, there's a lot of lack of awareness of soft skill. I started the interviewing practice by doing a lot of like lead code whiteboarding. When you actually go through real interviews, you start to realize that that's not really the only focus, right? There's a lack of awareness of soft skills. Um, many people that I've met in the past like six years, you know, I, I help many people um, go through technical interviews, and I realized that one one core problem is like lack of confidence. It's not so much about like oh you know like someone asks you a technical question, you may not be able to answer the question to your best of extent, but how do you make the most of the time that you spend with the interviewer apart from answering the question? Right, information asymmetry. There are some slides later where I'll talk about you know, how the difference of you know, view between the employer and the potential employee, right? Notice the HR, very, very often you think like, okay, you know, the HR has like maybe like 100 candidates, right, and you think, you have very finite choices of companies, but that's not true, right? By understanding what the HR person thinks you have, you would give yourself a slight advantage over them. So I went through like about four weeks of interview hell. The, I'll say hell because, you know, like uh, there will be ups and downs, right? You think you'll be smooth flowing, but no, right? Everything is different in practice compared to in theory. The, I, I try to put down as much of what I can uh, in these slides in principles. Over the years, I will probably revise this um, because I've been talking about this many in bits and pieces all around to Michael, to many of my other friends, you know. Um, and I try to like consolidate all of them together. And in general, the whole goal, right, is to improve everyone's interviewing experience because you're not going to interview today. You're not going to interview just for one job. You're going to do this again and again and again you will potentially be interviewers in future, right? And you want to give your future candidates a fair chance. <clears throat> so some of the prerequisites, um, of course, I'm not here to teach you interviewing common sense of what are the silly things or not to say, what, how not to carry, how not to, what are the things that you shouldn't do in an interview, like, you know, don't wear like t-shirt and berms <laughs> and slippers in there. 
Um, I'm not here to talk about technical fundamentals because everyone can just practice fundamentals by self. Go and take CS101, go through courses on Coursera, take a master's or something, right? You are supposed to practice lead, lead code by yourself. Uh, on average, maybe like 50, 50 medium questions or you know, easy to medium questions, depending what role you're interviewing from. This is like, uh, like who, who took like O-levels and A-levels over here? Probably every one of you, right? You know what is a 10-year series? <laughs> yeah, so doing lead code, okay, it's like grinding through a 10-year series, right? Through, through all levels, I did my 10-year series like twice. So when you see the, uh, the questions, you know, when you do like all levels, I mean, this is like more than 10 years ago, I mean like 2015, around there, right? You go through all levels, you see a question, and you realize that, hey, the answer must be B. Then you, then you look at what's B, then you realize, that, oh yeah, it's really B. Because you have seen the question so many times, you can just practice. Now, I know some people say that, like, Oh, like why are interviews like so like uh, one-dimensional? In a certain way, you can say yes, it's kind of like a game, right? It's like a game, you know, where everyone like does the same thing. There are a couple of standard questions, maybe they twist it around a bit, like physics questions in A levels. But at the end of the day, you realize that this is one aspect. Why I like it, this is one aspect that actually makes interviewing fair. They're not going to judge you, or they're not supposed to judge you by like gender or gender biasness or race, you know, it's supposed to judge you purely on like what you know, right? And what you have tried to do, what you have practiced. The interviewer expects you to know the fundamentals because you are supposed to have practiced. You're supposed to have read this, uh, well, in this book on interviewing, um, technical interviewing 101. I forgot what's the title, but yeah, yeah. Well, you, you don't have to read it like a Bible, but you're supposed to like, you know, go through some of them you know, as practice to know roughly what technical questions to expect. Okay, um, whiteboarding practice, definitely get a friend or you know, someone who has been in the industry long enough interviewing people, actually do questions on the whiteboard, right? They actually teach you some, this is not, this is not covered here, but you know, whiteboarding practice basically teaches you some tips and tricks on what are the do's and don'ts, like don't write in large font on the whiteboard you will run out of space, <laughs> right? Some, in the, some whiteboarding interviews, some companies, they are extremely rigorous, right? They'll tell you, write on the whiteboard as though you are coding, right? That means they'll want to see like every single, you know, how precise you are, how, how attentive you are to all the small details, right? And some of the solutions may just take up the whole whiteboard. You might need to write part one, then you erase half of it and write part two, or split the whiteboard in half. These are things you have to learn by experience, right? <clears throat> okay, so the first thing, okay, this will be somewhat of an interactive session. Um, you know, so you guys are like, it's the morning, right? You guys are supposed to be fresh and be able to stand up and do stuff, right? So one thing I want to do like, with you guys is goal setting. Right, before, inter before actually interviewing, you need to know what you want to get for yourself. You know, when you are going to get a new job, what do you want for yourself? Probably some of you have never thought of this before, but it's important to know what you want to get out of your next job, out of the next role, right? Go into your next role with a purpose, okay? Um, I'm gonna do a couple of poll over here, right? Um, so just, just to understand like you guys a bit better. Okay, so how many of you here are actively interviewing? Yeah, just, just a show of hands. Yeah, higher, higher, higher. Raise your hands higher, right? More confidence, right? Okay, how many of you, um, like this is your, you're, you're trying to look for your second job. How many of you are trying to look for your, is looking for the third job? Okay, how many of you are fresh grads? Okay. So being able, be, knowing like where you come from is really important because this will like shape how you actually think, how you go through the interview. Interview is not like one dimensional. You're supposed to pull forward all your previous experience as a person, right? So in figuring out your next job, okay, um, I want you guys to like really think, spend a minute or you know, two minutes to really think like, what is the goal? Why, why do you want to get in your next job? Is it because your previous job is too boring? I mean, you have to, have to be honest with yourself, right? If you're in a boring job, say your job is boring, right? No one, no one, employers shouldn't fault you if you find a job boring. Uh, that's why people move around, right? We want you to write down your goals, write down your goals, um, either, you know, like, because vocalizing your goals are very important. The more you tell people, the more you actually think about it, the closer you are to get 
to doing it, right? Um, there's a QR code over here. Okay, so you guys, spend, let's spend a minute to think about your goals. Tell the people around you, talk to the people around you. You guys probably don't know each other, or maybe some of you do know each other, but, <laughs> right? So just tell each other what your goals, exchange what your goals are. If you really don't want to, you can, if you want to tell me your goals, go ahead, use the QR code, fill in the form, right? And we can communicate offline, you know, if you need any, uh, someone to talk to or something. Yeah, let's spend a minute doing that. There's a link here. Does the code work or is anyone having any problems with it? Really? Yeah, yeah, it's a Google form. Okay, so who wants to like uh, stand up and share what your three goals are? Anyone? I'm going to start picking people. <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead. Okay, can everyone hear that? Yeah, so basically she wants to like use new skills right in like w uh, in, in that area in order to, you know, like because just, um, you know, it's a new thing and like technology should be able to improve like where you, whatever work you love doing, right? So can everyone like give her a round of applause? <laughs> right, you guys must be able to stand up, stand up and talk to people, tell people what you want, right? This is the first step. Does anyone want to try second, any second person? Michael, pick someone who you know is uh... Jason. <laughs> How would you know? <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking for a full stack role, or, and then uh, preferably a company that provides mentorship. Okay, yeah, give me a round of applause. <laughs> yes, knowing what you want clearly is very important, right? And I agree with him. You know, you want to find a company which is able to mentor you, able to help you grow as a person. One of the slides later, I'll go more into like what you guys should be looking out in the company, right? Shouldn't be looking at a company as just a job they do day in, day out, nine to five, right? I mean, like, I mean, maybe some of you like that, I don't know. But, you know, there's so much more you can get from a job. A job is not just a job, right? A job is supposed to support you as a person for what you really want to do in your life. <clears throat> and I'll say that is important. Uh, knowing what you want is important because we're going to go into week one where I started interviewing and I realized that, you know, um, I was kind of lost and I actually didn't know what I want, right? I started interviewing not knowing what I want, but I just decided to do it anyway because, you know, YOLO, right? <laughs> okay, week one, you said, you're never ready. You probably heard of this from some people say, don't care, don't think too much, right? Don't over plan, don't over practice, just go and do it, right? Because when you do it, it's very different. Okay, a couple of backstory of uh, why I ended up interviewing, right? So I was at this point, you know, in previous startup didn't do well. I was there for about six years, started going downhill, and like, you know, I, had a, I was at a quarter life crisis. It's like, I've been doing like back end stuff, like back end server engineering services for about professionally about six years. You know, and you reach a point where like 
hey, you know, it's like this is getting very like uh, monotonous, right? I mean, you yeah, you roughly know all the stuff, but I don't really know like if I can like learn more in that area. I enjoy um, hardware, right? I mentioned I enjoy hardware. I do embedded systems, you know, when I'm free in microcontroller, C, C++, this kind of stuff. And very often backend engineering, what will you what will you be using, right? You'll be using like uh, Rails or uh, J2E, right? Or hopefully not one of those arcane stacks like uh, uh, what, do you, what do you call that? Uh, Groovy. Anyone heard of Groovy over here? It, it's just bastardized Java. I don't know why people use it. Fortunately, it's defunct now, so it's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I was at. I actually needed a job. I was like doing my PR in the US. So I, was, I wasn't in the job for a while. And I, was, I realized that, yeah, I actually need, I, I was thinking of like, yeah, maybe you're going to do some startup or something else, you know, something challenging in life. But yeah, I actually needed a job to finish my PR process. So here I am. Um, and I, before this, I actually been like preparing or like trying to prepare. I mean, like, you know, you're not really focused. You try to do lead code and you can't really go, go very fast with that. I did quite a number of like uh, questions. I do whiteboarding with my other friends, you know, from like FA and G companies um, for a while. And it just gets really boring or tiring. Also, I thought at a point in time, right? I, I was like kind of like tired, lost. And you know, like after doing so many questions, you, you're kind of like confident, you know, you do questions, right? But no one tells you you are wrong, right? Lead code doesn't really tell you you are wrong. I mean, it tells you you are wrong is in like, you know, the compiler says that, Oh, your, your answer is not the same as the, what it's supposed to be. But no one tells you you're wrong as a human. No one tells you you're wrong in a sarcastic way, like, you know, like, like crossing your arms, staring you like, hmm. Or like, you know, you, you, you do your whiteboarding and you look at the interviewer. The interviewer just tells you like, hmm, giving you that face. And you don't really know, like, is he trying to hint you that it's like, are you going in the right direction? Or are you going like, you know, are you totally off tangent? Or maybe he just doesn't care. You're probably he's like 240th candidate of the year. Right? You thought you were a breeze, you may not really know what you really want. You know, specifically what role. I was actually interviewing, like people ask me like what role? I'm like, anything. <laughs> uh, that's not really a good answer to tell HR people, like, what, really, what role do you want? Like uh, anything that you know related to like coding. <laughs> or, yeah, or like what industry? Like, people ask you like, oh, uh, you know, so, so this is like in, in payments or like, or let me let's say visa in finance, right? It's like, oh, what, what do you like about this industry? And like, uh, you can't really answer that if you don't have a baseline in mind of what you want, right? And sometimes some HR people don't really like it because in the companies, they are supposed to find passionate people, not just a person who codes. So, yeah, so what? I initially thought interviewing would be like now, now you look at this photo, right? This this graph. You think you go through, you apply online, you uh, go through some phone interviews, or maybe some like some companies in Singapore. I heard they give you on-site MCQ questions. How many of you went through like MCQ questions on-site? Really, it still exists. Yeah. I thought it's like four years ago, <laughs> right? It's like yeah, like everyone went through like uh, A levels and things that is like uh, these kinds of things, but. I don't know. I, I mean, maybe it's fine. I, I'm, I'm not really opposed to it. I just, you know, find it surprising. Because in the US, we usually do online phone interviews with Skype. Uh, we are on hacker rank. So, like, you know, they see your screen and you say, like, okay, solve this problem. And you actually code in front of him. You code in front of him, either in a, <clears throat> it's like a shared notepad. You know, he actually sees, like, what you write, you know, so, so don't write. If, if you are not confident in the language, don't tell him, yeah, yeah, I, I really love this language, <laughs> right? And he'll look at you, see, uh, do some noob mistakes on screen, right? Um, and, you know, there's, there's like phone online interviews. There is, uh, and then you, you think you go on to on-site and you, you sign offers and that's done, right? But this probably is true if you are really lucky. You apply for one job, you go through a whole process and you get your offer. Or maybe you apply three and one reply, and you go through a process, you get an offer. But how often is this the case? And if you are lost, even worse, you apply to like 10 jobs, 20, 50. I actually applied to like 50, between 50-ish like roles, right, uh, online, because I was on many sites like A-List, Hire, I look at LinkedIn, there are a couple of like uh, those, those hipster startups that say, that, oh, use AI to match you with jobs. I, I bet it's just some a bunch of humans back there. Right, uh, uh, there's triple byte. I actually didn't use triple byte, but that's a story for another day. Um, yeah, you, you think it's like 
smooth sailing, right? But hell no, it's totally wrong because when I started and started applying, right, I'm like, YOLO, I, I start like, you know, just, just go ahead, go do it, right? And, and then you like, you go through interviews, you go through phone interviews, you go through so many phone interviews, you get them sian. Now, in Singapore, I can use the word sian, but in the US, I can't use this word because no one knows what it is, <laughs> right? You start feeling lost. Some of you who are more introverted, right, you talk to too many people, and you start feeling like, I don't want to talk to anyone for the next <laughs> one week. I, at, at that point in time, right, at that point in time, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this, right? I applied to like, I have like five, four phone interviews every single day. One hour, rest one hour, next interview, rest one hour, have lunch, go for another phone interview, back to back, five days a week, for the entire week. Now, I'm surprised no company works on Saturdays because they're supposed to be startups, but yeah, they don't work on Saturdays, fortunately, right? And after a whole week of that, you know, like, I, I really felt tired, lost, and you start questioning yourself, you know, why? It just makes your quarter life crisis worse. <laughs> because none of these phone interviews really tell you what you want. And they're going to tell you, like, oh, this job is for you, this job is not for you. No, no one is going to tell you that, right? They're only going to, like, give you uh, clueless faces or, like, potentially sarcastic remarks. I don't know. Not, not, I mean, they're not so mean, but I mean, like, they're kind of, like, you know, trying to, they're also trying to figure out if you are a potential good fit. Because what the phone interview is really for is basically to make sure that you are a potential candidate for the next round. Because the next round is usually with, like, actual engineers and their time is precious, so they don't want to waste their time interviewing you if you are not sure of what you want, right? And you go through more interviews, and maybe that gives you a morale boost or not, right? And, you know, you may feel lost. I actually felt lost at multiple, multiple points in time, right? Even after you, like, you get some offers, and you go through negotiation phase, like, how many of you hate negotiation? Like, negotiating pay, right? It's a, in Asia, it's a very taboo subject, right? Like, you know... Like someone asks you, okay, like we're gonna give you this salary. Have you ever, how many of you ever replied the HR person that say, have you given a counter proposal? No, I want this instead. One. Any more? No? Yeah. But surprisingly, in the US it's very common, right? And to a certain extent, HR companies know or prepare a budget, right, for you to, to accommodate you if you ever do it. Okay? And I'll talk more about this later. Right, but yes, negotiation is a very is something hard to do for many engineers because you know you, you just really just want to like you know code, you don't want to talk to people, you don't really like to argue about non-technical things. <laughs> right. So yes, sometimes it's a necessary evil. If you know you have to do it, you know that by doing it, you'll get yourself something slightly better, something you are happy with, you won't be you know so uh, so sour. You know, you don't want to like sign a comp compensation package that, like then Siena is like only like a, what, 5-10% increment, right? Okay, so the first thing that I want to address, okay, address the elephant in the room. Many of you have it, you're probably not talking about it, right? It's called imposter syndrome. Um, you are basically not confident. How many of you can honestly say you are confident in this room? You're confident about what you do. Right, I see no hands, so I assume all of you are kind of not confident, right? You are afraid that your accomplishments or whatever you tell the interviewer will be judged. You're afraid of being judged. I, I don't know why, but many people are afraid of being judged. You are being afraid that, you know, the interviewer will look down on you. How many people are, okay, let's be honest with yourself. How many of you are, af are afraid of being looked down upon? by the interviewer, or by anyone, by anyone in the, in the industry. Well, okay, that's good. More hands, more hands. Any more? Or, higher, higher. You raise your hands higher. Acknowledge the problem. Know that you have the problem, right? Okay. Know that you have the problem. And that's the first step, because you have to acknowledge that you have the problem, or else you could not possibly have addressed it. Right? Many of you have like this voice in your head that tells you, you know, like, oh, whatever I did may be, like, simple. You, you look at, like, you, you probably have met many other people in the industry, or maybe, you know, you, you, you know Michael, you know, he has, like, many years of experience. You, you feel <laughs> small, right? I mean, you, it's not just in this phase, in this life, but let's talk about in the past, when you were in school, right? Maybe you were last in class before. Have any one of you, like, 
failed a subject in formal education? Anyone got an F before? One, two, okay. Yes, oh, many of you, great. But you realize that right, many of you actually failed a subject before, right? But you look back. Did anyone really care you failed that subject? <laughs> okay, so yeah, some people may care, but who are the people who care you failed that subject? It's, okay, yeah, yeah, teacher, they're, they're paid to care, right? <laughs> your parents may care, why? Because, I don't know, like, because they compare you to your cousin or PSC scholarship, and they're like, hey, your cousin like that, you know, why, why are you not right? People compare with you. Now you realize that the people comparing you don't really care about your life in future. Right? At the end of the day, the only person who is responsible for your life is yourself. It's yourself. It's a voice in your head. The voice in your head makes you think, makes you think a lot of things. Right? You, some of you, or I'm not sure about you, but for myself, when I am anxious. Now when I was young, I was very like a very anxious about myself, you know, whenever you're like in school or like, I wouldn't be here talking today like at this voice. I'll be like, you know, I can't speak much at all. Um, you know, because I always have this, I see myself from a third person point of view. And wherever I plan to do something, before I plan to raise my hand, you know why most of you raise your hand halfway? Because this voice telling yourself, right, that if you raise your hand all the way up, someone is going to judge you. But I realize that everyone is facing the front. Actually, no one is really caring if you raise your hand high or not, right? It's very often, like, you tell yourself negative things. You, many of you have negative thoughts. That's natural, right? But you must know that this exists. The problem that exists is detriment to you when you are interviewing, right? When you are interviewing, these thoughts, you know, give you, um, it makes you anxious. It gives you some form of depression. I'll address this later. It is something that exists. Many of you are not clinically depressed. You don't take antidepressants or what medication, right? But you must know it exists in a small form to many of us. And it's normal when you are interacting with many people, I mean, for me at least, right? Results in reduced confidence. Reduced confidence, what happened? When you answer questions, when you talk to your interviewer, he's going to be like, you know, maybe, you know, this person doesn't know what he's doing. Right? I mean, I interviewed people before. It's very important to like, be able to show your true self. Not showing, it's not about showing like, oh, wow, you're like damn great, I'm damn suitable for this job. In fact, no interviewer expects candidate to be like a perfect fit for, this job, for a specific job. Right? They expect pros and cons. I mean, we're all human. We all have flaws. We all have, you must understand everyone of us has flaws. The other hundred candidates applying for the same job are probably like you. They probably have flaws. They have other issues in life, right? And yeah, you no know, poor whiteboarding performance. You are going to stall when you think about a solution. When you think about a technical solution, and you are panicking, and when you know your, your brain has like imagine like hundred percent CPU, right? And instead of spending your hundred percent CPU thinking out about the problem, solving the problem, simulating a problem in your head. You spend like 25% judging yourself, 25% thinking what your interviewer is probably thinking of you right now because you are stuck, right? So don't try not to think of those things. I'll show you what you can potentially do to alleviate it. You know, it's like there are many faces of yourself, right? It's like reviewing code. If you review your own code, you start to be, oh, you start to be very judgmental about yourself, right? At the end of the day, all these five people are probably you. Four out of five are just hitting yourself. <laughs> so don't hit yourself. For a start, right? Not saying you can't hit yourself on a normal basis, you can. <laughs> but for the interview, try to control it. Right? In general, you're yeah, probably thinking too much during an interview. I've been through it before. My first interview, okay? My first two interviews was terrible. Was terrible. Why why was it terrible? Because you rarely interact with uh, another human. <laughs> you interact with your friend who gives you white balling. It's like, yeah, you know he's a friend, but you know he's not someone who's actually making a decision, right? Like, like some of you like this, like you look at WhatsApp, you, you see this person typing, right? Especially, let's say you find, find some, uh, you know, some, your crush, right? You message your crush, blah, 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 you know, like, can we go for dinner? Then you see typing, dot, dot, dot. And that's it, one minute later typing, then you're thinking, what? Is she like, uh, you know, thinking what she replied? Does she like judge me? Is my profile pic on WhatsApp very nice? You know, 
But what is she actually doing later? Right? Maybe she, later she messaged you, Paisia, talking to BF. It's kind of side. She got boyfriend, really. Pure blood. Right? You think too much, but you don't really know what's really happening back there, right? You can scan the QR code. There's a it links to a YouTube video. It's quite funny. <laughs> right? So, how to deal with it? Okay. Uh, you guys don't really need to take notes because, I mean, writing down is great, but, you know, later this will be uh, recorded and released, right? List down your accomplishments. Um, it's very important to celebrate small wins in life. Your first hello world. How many, for every single language, the first thing you do, what, hello world, right? <laughs> Unless it's a language that does not output anything to screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even like, you know, you code for Arduino or something, you still have some form of console, you still can, you know, uh, print hello world, right? List down accomplishment. All the languages you learn, all the languages you try, right? You want to be able to show your true self. Now, you may not be able to do this today. Uh, for me, interviewing many times, talking to a lot of people, helped me find my true self. Now, my true self in front of another human, in front of a room full of human, not in front of a computer, <laughs> right? You know, in front of a computer, you're like, yes, you're like bouncing around in your chair, you know, <laughs> and like, yeah, you do something. But that's not your true self because you're not with real people, right? The computer doesn't have emotions. It doesn't, you know, right, celebrate with you, right? It only returns you, like, zero compile errors. Yeah, that's probably the only way it's happy with you, right? Understand your limits. What do I mean by understand your limits? When you tell your interviewers your strengths, your weaknesses, right? Especially when it comes to, like, language proficiency, okay? When a person asks you, like, how good are you? Blah, 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 right? Or you tell him, like, you know, how, you, how good you are as a language, how many years of experience. Don't say you are, like, very good. Oh, I am, like, very experienced with. Now, now interviewers, uh, I'm not sure of many interviewers, but just myself. If you say you are very experienced with something, okay, I'm probably going to start throwing you the hardest question <laughs> I have, right? So you have to understand your limits. Now, you are looking for a challenge. Yeah, you tell him, like, hey, I'm very experienced with, like, A, B, and C, <laughs> right? And yes, just go for it. I mean, after a while, you may tend to do that because, like, after a while, you, you start wanting to challenge the interviewer, right? But, but that's fine. You can do that, okay? But choose battles you can win, right? This is like fighting a war. Choose battles you can win. Portray yourself to the interviewer of what you want the interviewer to ask you. Of course, don't say, oh, yeah, I'm like, you know, uh, I'm a newbie or like, I'm not very familiar with all these languages. If you pull yourself too low, right, you are shortchanging yourself, you... Also, you know, like the person, you also may not match the role you're going to apply for, right? Generally, I'll say like for most uh, junior people, be proficient in at least one language. One language. At the end of the day, companies should not be looking for language proficiency. They should be looking for attitude, intelligence, logic, logical intelligence, because language Language proficiency, it just means that you have done your homework. It doesn't really tell much about you except, except for that. And many of you, many people can just do their homework as long as they put enough hours into it, right? So understanding your limits, portray your true self. You have to be honest with yourself okay, before you can expect the other person to see that you're not trying too hard or trying too little. Okay, yeah, be comfortable with who you are. Don't, there's nothing being, there's nothing wrong, right, being less, uh, you know, less experienced, okay? Everyone starts from somewhere. Back then, I was also new, right? I was doing, I didn't really, I, I know you're really a person who does well, like algorithmic questions as well. It takes a lot of practice, and only through experience can you are able to attain such, ex, yeah, such things. Um, yeah, basically keep things simple and honest. Like, you know, some people may say that, oh, during an interview, you start like talking a lot. You start trying to use a lot of adjectives. You know, you say you are very, you start using a lot of adjectives for yourself. I say, just don't bother with it. Just be simple. You know, just be simple. Be plain. I mean, not really like plain in terms of like nothing to say, but plain in terms of being straightforward. List down your languages. I just said, no, my, my top three preferred languages are like, like A, B, and C, right? See, most of the time you think that, yeah, you will be ready 
You're, you think you are ready before you go to interview, but you see the secret is that you are never ready. No one is ever ready. Even for people who apply to like Facebook, Google, whatever, right? You're never really ready for interviews. Even for interviewer, interviewer is never really ready as well. You have an interviewee, you know, that throws you a curveball, you're like, okay, you'll, you'll get stunned for a bit. Why he asked me such a question, <laughs> right? So no one's ever ready. Just go for it, right? Let me take a pause here. So if you're hesitating to <clears throat> interview, I'll say, don't stop, uh, don't stop, like, yeah, don't wait any further. Just try to go for some interviews. Um, try to go for some interviews in a sense that don't pack your entire day with interviews like me and like, you know, end up being like sad and stuff. But get some interviews, right? Apply to some places. Now, people who are having full-time jobs also go through interviews. It's not as though like, oh, I sit at this job for like one to two years. I don't try to find other opportunities outside. Now, after a while, you realize that, you know, people on like LinkedIn will be like messaging you saying that, oh, uh, can I like, um, will you be interested in this position? Blah, 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 new startup, whatever, fintech, Bitcoin stuff is uh, looking for some developer. Maybe I'm not interested in these roles. Right? I mean, like there's a whole bunch of people who poach you. You may not be interested in like 90% of them, but sometimes take it as a form of practice. Take it as a form of, self-verification to figure out where you stand in the industry today, right? Who in this room have worked at your previous job for more than four years? Raise of hand. Okay. Now, a problem with working in a job for too long. Now, you realize that um, probably here that in the Bay Area, in the US, whatever, developers usually change job every two years, right? Or every year. Now, so sometimes every year is a bit of a stretch. Right. Every two years sounds about right if the market is uh, hot. Every four years is good if you are stagnating at a company, you have no progression, and you want to find something new. Right? So interviewing okay, or taking the step to find out what you're worth in the industry is always good. Movement is always, almost always better than stagnation. You probably heard of this term called uh, decision paralysis. You spend a lot of time, or like companies spend a lot of time, hey, let's hire consultants A, B, and C, let's do evaluation matrices, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, and you spend a lot of time deciding. You probably sat through really boring meetings which you want to fall asleep, but you can't because your boss is sitting right there discussing about stuff. Just keep discussing without any actionable. Right? That's the most annoying thing. It also happens in tech as well. You know, discuss diagrams, blah, 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 but nothing really gets done. Right? Well, that's why we have agile workflows, but that's the story for another day. Movement is better than stagnation. It's better you do something. Do something. Take action now. Find out what happens. Find out the results and move on from there. Because there's never enough preparation. Now, I'm not saying all industries are the same. I'm only talking from a technical industry point of view. If you are building, let's say, uh, MRT, you better prepare the tracks before the train runs or if you have a train flying off the tracks, right? <laughs> you have to, you really want to like apply, like you, many of you probably heard of like agile, agile uh, workflow, whatever. Have you ever thought that you can apply that to your own life? You probably heard of the, the term from Facebook, you know, like the face, back in those days, right? They're saying in Facebook, they say fail fast, <laughs> right? Fail fast, it applies to your life as well, right? Whatever you want to do, you just try to do it. And if you fail, yeah, so be it. Why? You can try again. Interview is not like O levels or A levels. Oh, Kanasai, you got an F. Now an LRR5 is so large. It's probably one of the numbers where it's large and you don't like it. <laughs> right? That one you cannot try again, which is sad, right? But in reality, in the professional environment, may, very often you can try again. But as long as it's not like, too large a mistake, like something criminal or what. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you don't make a terrible reputation of yourself, you can try again. Right? Many companies uh, like Facebook and Google. You can reapply every six months. Now, it's, it's every six months, not because they can't make it sooner, because they, are, they are probably have like millions of candidates applying to them you know, very often. Not, not literally millions, but just like many candidates. They have to like slow you down. So they allow trying again, because they know people can improve over time. People can improve themselves to meet the standards that the company needs. <coughs> right, so yeah. 
only through experience, right? When you go through experience, you learn lesson, you improve yourself, and you try again. Nothing else can prepare you for that. Not really doing a lot of like 10 year series, or whatever you learn in the past, maybe in the past in the exams, doing a lot of practice. Math, when you do math, doing a lot of practice helps, but in the real world, not really, right? Um, yeah, so I've mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, yeah, this point about stop comparing yourself, it's like you're really running a race between yourself, between yourself today and between yourself yesterday. Yesterday you fail an interview, today you may not. Yesterday you cannot do some complex graph question on whiteboard. Doesn't mean today you cannot. You can always improve yourself, right? You can always improve yourself. You don't have to care what people think. Maybe I agree, sometimes interviewers can be sarcastic, right? I went through a fair share of them myself back then, you know, when I was a fresh grad. They can be sarcastic, but face it, you'll never see them a second time in your life, right? Today, this guy is like, oh, he's mean to me. You can spend the whole day feeling sad, oh my God, why is this guy so mean to me? Uh, like, yeah, right and be a bit heartbroken, I don't know why, but, or you can just don't give a F about what he thinks, right? And just move on, just move on and go for the next interview. It's probably, you probably have another like 10 lined up. You don't have time because I had so many interviews lined up back to back. I don't have time to care what they think. Just move on, right? Don't spend, don't waste time worrying. What, oh, you know, many of the times after interview that you worry, you know, what is like, what's the outcome? Right, is that guy going to call me back? Come on, lah. he's not your crush or what? He's not going to call you back, <laughs> right? If the interviewer is really interested in you, he will call you back, right? The company will get back to you. Um, usually in the US, many companies will tell you, you know, you're not really the right fit, blah, blah, blah. That's nice, but you don't have to expect that, right? Don't waste time worrying. Have active practice. When you're interviewing, it does not mean that you stop doing lead code. In fact, you try to do even more lead code. You try to do even more every single day. You try to do it faster. At the start, you probably do some questions, some practice questions. You probably spend like uh, some of my friends, they spend uh, like a whole day doing one lead code question. You're supposed to do it in 15 minutes because in the real interview setting, in a real interview, right, on site, you'll probably only have 45 minutes or one hour with the interviewer. An interviewer is going to ask you two questions. And he's going to talk stuff with you for 15 minutes. So 45 minutes, 15 minutes spending talking about, you know, finding out, oh, talk about yourself, blah, blah, blah. You have 30 minutes for two questions. That means you have to respond, execute the question as fast as possible on the whiteboard, right? You don't really, you have to practice speed. You probably have heard your math teacher tell this when you're young. Right? When you do a math question, it's really about speed because you know, in an exam, you don't have all day to do like a 10 mark math question during the exam, right? But all links back to the fundamental reason of not caring what people think. You care too much for what people think, you're going to get stuck. You're going to store yourself on a whiteboard, right? No interviewer is going to ask you, do you know what I think? <laughs> No, no one's going to ask you that. It doesn't matter what you think. You look at, you have to portray, you can, I don't know, you, you guys like grow up looking at this guy in like WWE or something, whatever, right? You know, you go, go look at, I didn't have the YouTube, but you can go look on the YouTube video, right? He doesn't care what people think. Of course, he's acting, but it's great at a point in time, right? So many of you probably have heard who is Ben Leong. He'll probably watch this at some point in time. Uh, he's often found on NUS Whispers. Um, yeah, and yeah, there's a lot of stuff. You know, but I'm not going to talk about all those things. You can read it yourself. Um, I worked for him for quite a while back when I was an uh, undergrad in NUS School of Computing. Um, and he told me this, right? And it really stuck with me for a very long time. So it was a point in time where, as a student, I think I was in year one and a half, uh, I kind of like, failed a math module, you know, because like back in university, you are like, you come from, so I, I came from like uh, A-levels, and you think that when you do math in university, you see like, oh, differentiation, hey, this looks very easy, huh? okay? And you disappear for like three lectures, and then you come in the fourth lecture, it's like, what the F is this? <laughs> right? 
And yeah, I was like busy with some other modules and you know, I didn't really do well in school. I got a bit lost. So he told me this, right? Like, you don't have to be worried about where you are today, right? You just have to ensure that every single day, you try to be better than who you are yesterday. Every day, you just need one small improvement. Even if you think you have nothing, right? Even if you, are, if you think you are on a down, downward spiral, you just have to try your best to have one thing better today. Maybe you make your bed. It can be something simple. You make your bed in the morning, right? Maybe you uh, talk to your parents a bit more, right? <laughs> or maybe you just go to the gym five more minutes. But it all adds up. If you are better than you were before every single day, compared to a person who spends his time wailing in despair, you know, rolling around in the mud, right, having negative thoughts. Over one year, you have been better in 365 different ways. Right? <clears throat> okay, let's have a pause here. So now, earlier on, sorry, later there's a break, slot, yeah. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about like finding purpose. Like we went back earlier, earlier in point in time, I was telling you guys to have three goals, okay? Now, you have to uh, find a purpose before you go for your interviews. I'm saying this from experience and I made a mistake, you know, I didn't have a purpose. Because they're going to ask you a couple of uh, questions in your first interview, you know, like, uh, why do you choose this job, right? Uh, tell me about yourself. Now, if you, go in, if you go in there with a blank slate, you're going to be lost. You don't really know what to respond. Like, I mean, truthfully, tell, just ask yourself, lah, right? I mean, the real reason why you choose this job is because you need to eat, right? You need money, right? Maslow's basic rules, the bottom rung is why you really choose, why, why you choose the job initially. Not saying, now we don't deny that everyone has these basic needs, right? But interviews are looking out for something different. So I'll talk more about this later, but yeah, think about your purpose in life. Maybe draw lessons from your previous job, okay? Draw lessons from your previous job, your previous role. If you are a fresh grad, if you're a fresh grad, it's good to think about where you want to be in life. I, I know this sounds very fluffy. You know, I, I go through like secondary school and like uh, they have this like whatever motivational speaker starting with the name, starting with A, can't talk to you, you know. Um, very common. Um, yeah, I mean, I have my own opinions, but you know, it's like some part of it is, makes sense, right? You have to have some purpose. Having a purpose means having a vision in your head. Starting with a baseline, starts with a baseline for you to base your decisions, to base your principles on, right? You, I mean, some of them may ask you to talk about what you're doing, your previous job. You don't want to be boring and say, uh, previous job, uh, I was a waiter or I was a nurse or yeah, I was uh, serving stuff. You don't want to sound boring. You want to sound like you have a purpose. You, were, you want to sound like you were in that job for a reason. There must be a reason. There must be a reason greater than yourself. Right? You can't... Uh, like if someone asks you, like, you know, like, why do you choose this job? You can't tell them, like, uh, no, la, the job chose me. <laughs> <laughs> you can I mean... Yeah, you know, uh, I saw your job ad on LinkedIn. I clicked apply. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, uh, truthfully, yes, that's what happened to me. You know, I saw that job. I went down on A-list, angel list. Some of you might have seen it before. You always search uh, job roles and you see, oh, there are these companies dealing with this technology. Apply, 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 apply. And yeah, now I go on to uh, Hired. Hey, Hired give me a five choices. Uh, only five, apply, apply, apply. Like, yeah, I mean, try to have a purpose so you won't be like, no, so aimlessly, uh, don't tell your interviewer. Uh, I saw your post on LinkedIn. I found it, I find it mildly interesting. <laughs> you know, um, that comes uh, can come across incorrectly. Even even really found it slightly interesting. Don't tell him. You know, you find it slightly interesting, right? Um, yeah. So prepare personal stories. It's good to be personable. It's good to share what the interviewer does not know or doesn't expect you to say. Not in a bad way, right? Share what the interviewer would like to hear from a personal point of view. 
share with him your personal goals, your personal views on life. What I mean by personal stories, right? By why you chose a certain job. It should be, or I won't say it should be, it could be because let's say you manage a team in your previous job, it was too small. The company wasn't hiring for various legit reasons. So you want to find a job which allows you to command a larger team, for you to lead a larger team to build more great things, right? To build more things that are more complicated. Now, some of you may, may be like, a, let's say you're from a smaller company, a small startup, you probably serve like 3,000 users. You look at your graphs, like 3,000 users, the daily average. And you're saying like, one day you want to work at Facebook, you want to work on something tangible, something that serves millions of users every day, right? From a technical point of view, some of you may say that, I want to do something more complex. You know, you want to challenge yourself. You, you do the same thing every day. You'll find out, hey, damn, Sienna, every day I'm just like shifting values, you know, and just, just to like achieve business goals. Some of you may not like doing that, and I agree. It's boring. It pays, but it's boring. That's why you want to find a job change, right? You want to deliver, you may want to believe in a product that actually delivers value to people. Some of you may say, oh, I want to look into like green technology, or I want to look into uh, waste management technologies, or uh, you know, like SP energy management, or maybe you want to go to GovTech, or maybe you want to you know, go move abroad and work in, a con uh, in larger companies that you know, handle, serves up to millions of users internationally. That's fine, that's your choice. But at least have something. Something is better than nothing. Okay? Yeah, so, yeah, find, find your purpose, okay? These are the three rules I like to tell people. No purpose is too small. As long as you make it sound convincing and you make it sound great, right? Your purpose doesn't have to be big. Don't, you don't need to say, oh, you know, I want to like, uh, have a work on a product that serves millions of people. It can be simple. It can be simple. Let's say that I like to teach, right? I like to teach, but I can't stand kids. So I, write, I like to teach people technical stuff, <laughs> right? At least they speak, they can converse with you, you know, in a logical, technical terms. You can debate about issues. You can say that you would like to help your teammates grow as a person. You help your co-workers, right? You, can, you want to mentor your co-workers, you would like to teach things that you know, right? You can say you would like to share your experience from, you know, from, another com uh, from another company or maybe let's say, let's say in future you have a lot more experience. You just say you want to help your co-workers right, be better, be better as an engineer. Some of my friends, they have come up from a point of view that they want to bring about better engineering management practices to Singapore, right? They want to change the way things are run. Now, we, we probably have seen many examples that how engineering, you know, in general is run terribly in many companies. And you can just plainly say, you know, why do I join your company? Because your engineering practices are terrible. Of course, don't say that. You, you want to be able to improve your engineering practices, right? It can be simple. As long as it's well-defined, so you can put it in words, in a few words, and the person understands it. That is all. <clears throat> okay, so week two. Now, we're going to have a break soon, don't worry. I know this is a very long session, but this is week two. We have gone through week zero and one. Now, week two is basically pain. If you are going through like five interviews every day, you know, five days a week, you will feel pain. It's the same as running. Any of you run like more than 10 km before, uh, excluding, excluding in NS. Any of you run 10, more than 10 km before yourself? None, nah, really. Uh. Okay, a few. Right? When you run long distance, you feel pain. And, if, and for the rest of you who haven't run like, more than 10 km before, I suggest you give it a try. Right? It's sometimes good to experience pain. Many of you are like, you know, you probably don't, many, many people, right? I mean, not, not talking about just humans, but many animals, you, you shy away from pain. You think it's a negative thing. But pain is really just in your mind. It's just a feedback. They're saying that, oh, you don't like it. <laughs> you don't like it doesn't mean it's bad, right? It can be good as well. Of course, you take it to extremes, you'll probably like, uh, get like a uh, tear a tendon or something, <laughs> right? But it can be good. 
and see why. Now, let's talk about what happened. Okay. Um, so after my first week, what happened was that uh, I had way too much social interaction. Uh, I get extremely socially tired. It's probably like the most in my life. So this interview process, okay, just to put it straightforward, is the first time I actually interviewed for a job. Many of us in the industry, we get jobs by referrals. You know, you ask a friend, hey, I'm graduating soon. Your company looks interesting. Can I join? Uh? <laughs> right? It's, it's normal. It's fine. Many of us are lazy. I get it. Right? I'm lazy as well. You know, it's like when I've graduated, like, a couple of job offers from friends, right? Or people who you know, people who are working and like, hey, uh, my company hiring, interested or not? Okay, lor. just go, you know, take a look, right? It's very easy to go down that route. But it doesn't mean you're getting the best choice. Now, I only realized this after a few years. You can go down the easy route, get an easy job, but are you really getting the best job? Maybe you don't care about the best job. I don't know. But why don't you give it a try? Why don't you try to get the best job that you can? Now, best is different for everyone. It doesn't mean the highest pay. The best job, define it in your own terms. Right? So too much social interaction. Um, I was uncertain. I was uncertain in the sense of like what job should I apply now. I, I told you many of the jobs I apply just because they appeared on A list or LinkedIn. I just applied, right? Um, I was basically like overwhelmed by talking to people every day, feeling now when, when you don't have time for rest or you know like I have this problem like whenever you have an interview coming up the day before, right? I can't sleep. How many of you cannot sleep the night before an interview? Just be honest with yourself. Just raise your hand. No one's gonna judge you. Right, okay, a few of you, that's good, that's not bad, but it exists, right? And it exists, it's going to draw you down. It means that you probably cannot interview every single day, okay? I have that problem too uh, at the start because you're too nervous, you're too anxious, you're too anxious, you can't sleep. So what happens after my first week, I decided, okay, shit, man, this is going downhill. Um, so I just went, one, I took a week off, I just went for a holiday, you know, drove like uh, for a whole day up north to Seattle, visit a friend, you know, and, and do a, yeah, just chill out, right? Um, uh, some of you have noticed this, like, life, life is painful. When you interview that much, okay, out of desperation, or maybe just, you know, out of a sheer, uh, just, you just want to find trouble for yourself. <laughs> you, know, you think life is so slack because you're just doing lead code every day, you feel bored, you just want some challenge. And you ask for it, you ask for it, and you feel pain, right? You, who watches uh, Rick and Morty over here? Show of hands. Really? So few? More people should watch Rick and Morty. Why? It gives you an honest view of life. It just gives you, it just shows you the things you don't, you don't want to see. It's every single character of Rick and Morty is just you, it's some part of you, inside you, right? So, it's very important to identify what you feel. Now, I went through this point in time when I'm feeling really low, okay? You really don't feel like carrying on. How many of you interviewed and you stopped? How many of you stopped interviewing for some time? Really? No one? Okay, some? It's good to be honest with yourself. It's fine. No one is going to judge you for stopping your interviews midway. It's okay to tell your interviewers, right, that... I want to push back my interview two weeks later, one month later. I push back some interviews one month later. I mean, I don't care, right? I just tell them, you know, I'm just feeling tired. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take a break. Uh, did I tell them? Yeah, I told them I was going on a holiday or something. But it's very important to identify what you feel and do something about it. Um, I want to raise this point because I experienced feelings that I didn't know what it was, right? Some point in time where you feel that you can't get out of bed every morning, when you feel that you know your whole day is glooming, like the sun is actually super shiny outside, but you you think it's raining. Uh, it doesn't really happen in Singapore because it is, yeah, it can be sunny and it's raining every day. But you know, in the US, you know, it can be super sunny. It's, it's very nice weather, right? But you just feel shit, right? <clears throat> you have to identify your feelings. You have to be honest with your feelings. Okay, you. You want to, some, some of the traits, like compulsive behavior, if you start feeling like some, you know, you, you feel inclined to do certain things. Okay, like, like for me, you know, it's like, I just, I just can't get out of bed. 
uh, for some time, every single day, you end up sleeping. I think at one point in time, I was sleeping like 12, 18 hours. Imagine spending 18 hours in bed, not because you're sick, but because you just don't want to get, get up. You don't want to open your eyes. You think that dreaming is better than reality. Yes, that's sometimes that it can get that bad. Compulsive behavior. Yeah, you know, you may feel, um, how would I say, like uh, issues. You may feel issues. You may feel like some of you may binge eat, may eat a lot. You may feel like, hey, I must snack on something. Maybe you are, maybe you're not sleeping. So people dif- react in different ways. Some of you may be like clicking at Facebook all day. I, I read of one symptom where people will scroll Instagram the whole day and not stop. <laughs> I don't know why. Like, oh, at first I look at uh, famous, uh, what are called celebrities, right? Now I start looking at cat photos, cat photos, cat photos. Or oh, now later dog photos, dog photos, Pomeranian, Pomeranian, more Pomeranians, right? And you do that a lot. You realize, then you realize that that's kind of weird. <laughs> Maybe you walk out to go and tapao some food. As you're walking, you start scrolling cat videos, cat videos, cat videos. Something's wrong. Something's wrong with you. Okay, may- maybe that's your normal, I don't know. <laughs> but something is potentially wrong, okay? Um, and because of that, you may have insomnia. You may not be able to sleep. Why can't you sleep? You could be anxious, okay? You could be worried about pe- interviewers not calling you back. You may be just staring at your phone for too long. You never turn on night mode, so your phone is super bright. In bed for two hours, it's now 5 a.m. and you're still staring at cat videos or your ex-girlfriend, or whatever, right? And you're feeling really sad, you're feeling really down, and you can't sleep, okay? Maybe some of you may have cold sweat, or you're sweating because you never turn on aircon, I don't know. But it can be cold, and you're perspiring for some unknown reason. Um, yeah, this is what I mentioned earlier. You can't get around your daily routine, okay? When you experience this, you probably have some form of depression. You uh, may or may not decide to seek treatment. You, some of you may you know, be already on medication. That's fine. Just keep taking them or up your dosage. Some of you may want to find ways of uh, dealing with it, right? So what I'm going to say is that this is normal. If you are kind of like an introverted person, I don't know if this happens to everyone. If you are like kind of introverted like myself in the past or now, I don't know, right? When you go through interviews and you overexert yourself, you have cycles of mild depression. I'm not clinically trained or whatever, I'll just claim it as mild depression, right? Because you are unable to carry on, okay? The very fact that you cannot carry on, you're unwilling to carry on means that you feel that, you know, something doesn't feel right. Now I want to say, um, you look at the graph, right? It f- swings between mild depression and elation. I'm going to say this in advance, that mild depression is a temporary thing. Very often, I'm not sure if it happens to everyone, but sometimes, okay, you may feel after a period where you can't get out of bed, suddenly the next week, you know, every single day you're getting up at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. I don't know why. I get up at 7 a.m. I start going to a gym. I start gymming harder every single day. You start doing stuff. You start being like, I don't know, suddenly you start laughing yourself. You know, you drive to the gym or, or, or you go to the gym. I, I, it could be kind of weird to laugh on the train <laughs> or on the bus, right? I mean, you'll be like, oh, a scene of the Joker, but maybe that's what it is. Um, you know, you start laughing yourself or you start feeling very happy, right? It's like, yeah, you know, you're going around your day. You are suddenly so happy you are working out. You're able to talk to people suddenly, right? I'm going to say that's normal. It's normal because, because I read that it's normal. After a depressive episode, you may feel very happy for some unknown reason, right? And we're going to move to this section where it's important to, number one, you acknowledge it exists. You see the symptoms, okay? You want to spend as little downtime. Now, all this you may think is fine. Maybe you take some time off. It's fine. But it means that you have downtime. It means that you have spent time not interviewing. You have spent time not doing lead code. This is wasted time. Now, it could go on, not for days, it could go on for weeks, it could go on for months without you knowing. Without you knowing, half a year has passed. Then you realize, hey, shit, I've been not working for half a year. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so rejection is normal, okay? If you go for 10 phone interviews and all 10 of them don't get back to you, it's normal. I've heard stories of people applying for 20, 50 jobs and 
applying, uh, haven't even go for phone interview, and now then get back. It's normal. Maybe the industry is bad. Maybe it's a bad timing. Maybe you have not tried other countries, right? It's normal, okay? Maybe your methodology is wrong. Maybe your CV is weird. <laughs> I always talk about CVs over here because it's another story for another day, you know, but definitely revising your CV is important. Um, yeah, there's, at the end, I'll ask you guys, you know, if you want, you can send me your CVs for a brief review. Um, don't overthink, right? The more you overthink, it's very, very, it's very easy to get in a downward spiral when you're feeling sad, okay? And you keep thinking why you're sad. You keep rethinking, you keep replaying your interview experience in your head, okay? Don't replay your interview experience in your head when you're not feeling up for it. There's no point. There's no point repeating the same scene, the same screw up where you, can, where you can't do the question on the whiteboard. Some of you may have experienced this, right? You can't do something on the whiteboard. Shit, you think back, I could have solved that question. And you keep harping around it. You keep replaying it in your head. So you feel sad. So don't. If you think you, are, if you know you're doing it, stop it, okay? Just stop it, right? A very easy way, now we just read online, Endorphins are what keeps you driving every single day. There are many ways of getting endorphins, right? Most simplest one, or one of the few simplest one, is simply just exercise, okay? Exercise is important. Now, it's not common to exercise in Singapore. Many of us don't have access to a gym, or the gym is maybe too expensive or whatever, right? But it's important. It's important to keep yourself in good shape. Keeping yourself in good shape is one of the things that helps you keep going every single day. Every single day. Right, cardio exercise is important, so you have the stamina. Now, some of you may think, that how, many, how many of you like, cannot sit at a computer for more than eight hours, six hours? Okay. <coughs> yeah, many of you can't sit at a computer for so long. You know, I can sit at a computer for more than 24 hours, 36 hours, right? Because it's a hackathon, you can't stop doing whatever you are doing. Or, or for some reason, you are crunch time. People in the game industry, Right, have this thing called crunch time where they code, they, they try to uh, code as fast as they can to you know, ship their games, and that's why many games have bugs, but I digress. <laughs> right? <laughs> not, not saying that you should sit at a computer for very long, but you need to have a stamina. Stamina is not really just about running for a long time. You know, it's about enduring what your body feels, counteracting it, and keep doing what you have to do. Okay? You have to exercise, you have to actively manage your thoughts. Very often like in school or wherever, you feel like uh, you have all kinds of thoughts in your head, right? Thoughts are what slows you down. Thoughts are what slows you down. Because when you spend your time thinking about whatever you're feeling, right, your work doesn't get done. Your work doesn't get done, okay? So you have to stop, keep your mind focused. You have to keep your mind focused and exercise is one way to help you achieve that. Because you keep your mind focused, you keep your mind focused on your legs, your hands, you keep your legs moving when you run long distance. I don't run very long distance, I mean like about 10 km at most, right? But that is the lesson that I learned from cardio exercise, okay? If you find yourself, worst case, worst case, you, know, you, you stop very often. You, if you're a type who, you know, you, you run and you take, you, you stop for a walk, you know, instead of like running 10 km, you'll probably walk half the way. Right? But you walk half the way, and maybe like you run for like one minute and you stop, you start walking. Right? So this happens in real life as well. Whether you're doing work or interviewing, you do lead code, you get stuck at a question. You're like, ah, oh, Sienna, I go have lunch or whatever. That's fine. Right? Focus on small wins. Okay? Celebrate your small wins. You could have solved an easier question. You could stop doing this question. Okay? You will find medium questions or lead code hard, do easy questions. No one is going to judge you for doing easy questions. In fact, easy questions could also be asked by an interviewer as well, right? Usually interviewer asks a whole range of questions to test where you are at, right? So celebrate small wins. Be happy that you, you have achieved, have milestones when, when I was grinding through the code, right? It's like, you can start with one question, two questions, five questions. Every time you hit a milestone, number of questions you complete, that's great. That's great. Reward yourself, go and eat ramen or something. But don't you know, end up like binge eating, okay? <clears throat> now, yeah, you know, at the end of depression is like, understand that you will feel happy, okay? Sadness is undesirable, yeah, I get that, 
right? But sadness exists every single day. It's normal to feel sad. As a human, as a human, you feel, right? And it's happy. It's normal to, you know, feel sad because at the end of the day, right, you will feel happy. You will suddenly feel happy for no for some unknown reason. Maybe some of you will not get that, but you know that it's not a permanent state. It's not a permanent state as long as you allow yourself to get out of it. Yeah, uh, this is probably this term called uh, cyclothymia. Um, don't worry, it's not really, uh, you probably will not have this because it's something that should happen over a long term, right? So what this means is that whatever you're feeling is just normal. Don't worry, get over it. I find this a very motivational quote. Uh, who watches this? No one, really? No? Right? Yeah, so, you know, every time I'm like feeling like down and everything, I just look at this meme because it happens very often. I don't know why. Right? Like, when you're sad, you stop being sad and become awesome instead. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds simple. It sounds simple, but I tell you it works. It works, okay? If you portray yourself to be awesome, you just get up. You just get up of bed. If you can't get out of bed, just get out of bed. I don't care how you do it. Just roll yourself out of bed, come crashing into the ground. If you feel pain falling off the bed, that's even better. Pain reminds you that you're alive. Reminds you that you're alive. If you don't feel pain, you're probably dead or something. I don't know. Right? And just be awesome. Because at the end of the day, as mentioned before, no one's going to judge you. Only you are judging yourself. You can be awesome. You can talk to people. You can laugh. Right? You can laugh at yourself. It's fine. You can talk to yourself. If no one to talk to at home, because maybe you, know, you're, you, you can't communicate very well, that's fine. Talk to yourself first. Talk to yourself in the mirror, right? Because, you know, if you laugh in the mirror, someone is laughing back at you. <laughs> okay? Now, this slide is very important. Very often, you have to understand what other people are experiencing. You have to understand this structure. Keep it in mind. I mean, you don't have to memorize it, okay? But understand that whatever you do, whatever everyone does in this world, tends to gra gravitate towards this. Everyone wants, you know, like uh, physical safety, um, love and belonging. Um, you can read this yourself, right? But ultimately, you know why I keep talking about purpose, about finding your purpose? It's at the top. The top thing is the thing that really matters, self-actualization. When a company, when an interviewer asks you, like, asks you a question, like, why do you choose this job? He really wants to know if you are there, okay? You must understand that interviewers or like many people in tech jobs or whatever, right? You are in a tech role, creating stuff. You code, why do you code? You create stuff because you want to change something. Coding is not, it's just a skill, you know, it's just a skill. It doesn't mean you're, you're some people may be like, yeah, maybe they have like ego or whatever. They say, oh yeah, I have, I'm at Google, I'm at Facebook, you know, I have this great job, I have free food every day, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, that's, that's one thing, I mean, they can brag, it's fine. Let them be. But at the end of the day, it's really just a skill that's used to help people. Why Facebook exists in the early days? It's just help people connect, right? Maybe Mark Zuckerberg wanted to know more people. Maybe he's like, you know, feeling sad in college. He was looking at friends and he feels sad. He doesn't have much friends. Just saying, just kidding, <laughs> right? Um, and so he wants to create something so that he can have more friends, right? And you code because you can build things and building things itself is a gift. Many people cannot build things. Do you believe that? Many people cannot build things. Many people can only buy things. You know, there's a quote by, the, by a, a rich person, right? He paid like millions of dollars to build a custom vehicle. He said this, I'm actually quite useless. I only know how to pay money. I don't know how to do things myself, <laughs> right? And that's actually true. Many people, many people are only good at a specific set of skills. So if you are good, if you are coding today, if you write your first Hello World, you're good at something. You're, put, you're good at something, and that is to be able to create stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, and the last part of uh, this week, right, is this thing called Carlos Mind. So, some of you may have, you have heard about this before, right? It's uh, part, of, part of one of this. Um, yeah, so. I read this from this book called David Goggins. Um, I've been reading a lot of like self-motivational books. How many of you listen to audiobooks or read motivational books over here? Raise your hands. Okay, not bad. 
I, I think more people should be reading motivational books or audio books. Let's say if you are commuting to town or you know halfway across the island because it takes about half an hour to get anywhere, right? You go and listen to something, go and subscribe to Audible. Okay? Motivational books is one of the things that helps you lift you out of depression. Okay? Because listening to people's stories is one of the th simple things you can do for yourself. You know that pain is only temporary. Now this chapter is about pain, right? Because my first week was very painful. But what I come to realize that it's temporary. You can take a holiday. You can, you know, you can take a break. You can stop it. You can stop. Not saying you should. Not saying you should. But you can pause. Okay. But what you should be doing, okay, is you should be dealing with. It. You should be learning how to deal with it. You probably have heard of stories where, how, uh, you know, like how, uh, like okay, let's say you do cardio, right? You go and run. You go and run long distance. Okay. You feel pain. Now eventually the pain disappears. After the first like 1 km or so, the pain disappears. Your body deals with it. But your mind does not. Okay? Your mind may not deal with, your mind may not understand the pain you're feeling at that point in time. You have to learn how to make the uncomfortable decision. Now, the very fact that you make the decision to change the job, right? Is, now how many of you can honestly say that making a job change is hard for you? No? Okay. Okay, that's great. Many of you acknowledge that it's hard for you to do the job change. And I agree with that. I was at my previous job for six plus years. It's actually very long for anyone in the Bay Area to be in a job for so long, right? Because it's hard for me to change a job. It's uncomfortable to go and interview, to find a new job. But I'm glad you made this decision, right? Because it's basically for your own benefit. You learn how to make the un uncomfortable decision you probably have a whole list of excuses now. When I, when I was like sitting around in my previous job, okay, you know, I made a whole list of excuses. What are some of them? Right? I, was, I keep thinking, you know, oh, my job is great. You know, it's like, you know, I'm very like, comfortable. I'm very like, you know, I have like friendly, supportive co-workers. But if you think about it, they're really excuses. You are, you're ignoring the other side of defense, right? Which is like, you could potentially get a pay raise you would be challenging yourself in a different environment. The whole point about pain is you're supposed to challenge yourself. Challenging yourself is painful, but you know you have to do it, right? And you should be glad that you take the first step to do it. Okay, so this is the audio book over here. There are a lot of points uh, in it but, um, that I'm not going to go through over here. I suggest you listen to the audio book. I suggest that you listen to the audio book instead of reading it because number one, is is better if someone reads it to you, okay? Because it's a now you know you early on I mentioned that there's a voice in your head that always gives you negative thoughts that always judges yourself. If you listen to audio book, audio books, frequent enough, this voice will replace your negative voice in your head. You always have this voice. You always have this voice telling you their story, telling you how to go through pain, how to keep enduring, how to keep interviewing, even though. It's painful how to keep doing lead code questions even though you feel disappointed and you don't want to carry on. Right? So you don't have to keep making excuses for yourself. Okay? Um, yeah. Right, so there are essentially three points. Now you are too occupied. You have, maybe your audiobook list is long. There are only three things that I want to go through over here, okay? Obsession with mitigating pain. You have to want to make, keep making the hard decisions. You want to keep moving forward. Tenacity is very important, not only in interviewing in many phases of life. You could be a salesperson. If you are a salesperson, if you really love what you do, it's not being about salesperson 9 to 5. You have to be a salesperson 24-7. You have to keep selling what you sell to every single person out there. You keep refining your craft, right? Because you, have, you, want, to, you want to be able to, you know that there is an end in mind. You know that the pain is never permanent because you will get there. You eventually get it. You know that you eventually land a job. You eventually be in a place you want to be. Not now, but sometime. Sometime. You know you will get there. The goal is, the goal exists and it's achievable. Because there's many of you out here who would have achieved your goals, our goals in the past. The process is not very different, right? And this is the beauty of uh, doing cardio exercise like running long distance. You run, right? You say that, okay, I'm going to run 10 km, right? And you start running. And you know that if you don't stop, 
you eventually get there. Yeah, and like a 10 km job is like going through 10 interviews. You think that how many of you had you know have to go through more than 10 interviews? Can raise your hands? Right. Okay, that's great. Right? Because there's no limit to the number of interviews you can go through. There's hundreds of jobs out there, there's thousands of jobs out there. Right. If not in this row, it could be for a different row. Half a year later, oh, I don't want to do back end, I want to do front end. You can do that, right? There's no limit over there. Right? The first few hurts. But as you keep doing it, you, you get numb to it. You know you'll be numb to it. I'm telling you, you'll be numb to it. If you don't believe, maybe like one month later, you'll be saying the same thing. It's like, oh yeah, interviewing is like just like this, just go through it. Right. Okay, I know this is a very long session. Um, this is an intermission, intermission over here. Let's have a 15 minute break or something. Yeah. Thanks. My test. Yeah, so week three is back to interviewing, right? Um, after I had my like second holiday because I was feeling down. So, so during my week three of interviewing, you know, every single week it has been intensive. Now, I remember me mentioning about how like the phone interview week was right, very intensive, like five phone interviews like back to back every day. Sorry? Oh, it's too loud? Yeah. Test, test. My test, one, two. Effect, effect, effect. Is, is this one? Don't yeah. take My test, one, two. Is it better? Or is it the same? My test, one, two. My test, one, two. Yeah. My test one, two. Is it better now? Test, test. I think when you're talking there, it's a lot of people. Whereas if you're talking like here, part of my it doesn't have so much. Here's better. Maybe just turn down the volume a bit more. Test, test, test. My test one, two. <coughs> my test one, two. No, there's no, no sound now. <laughs> my test one, two. Is this okay? It's okay? okay. Now basically week three and week three and week four is basically really intensive as well. Um, I basically lined up like my interviews back to back for even for on sites. Now on site interviews in the US, right, is uh, very intensive. I'm not sure about Singapore, but you know, on site interview in the US, you know, you would go to uh, you go to a company, you basically spend like half a day over there. You spend like talking to as many as between four to eight people in that afternoon itself. Now imagine you have to do this every single day, right? Every single day I have to spend like about like five hours, five to six hours at different companies. It can get very tiring, right? Now, but you see, whenever you, you go to on-site interview, it's very different from online interview. Online interview, you, um, you know, you, the person doesn't really see your face. Maybe he sees your face, but it's like so pixelated, like what, 240p? <laughs> Right, especially if you yeah you you never you never put makeup, you don't want to like you no know, look, you don't want the person to uh, see your face too clearly. Okay, go and set the the uh, camera quality to be a bit terrible, right? Because you care more about the code you're going to write on screen, the question you're going to uh, the questions they're answering on the online interview. But on-site interview is different. The person is going to you know like interact with you, right? It's it's like you have to show that you have the energy, right? We, 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 very often, like uh, in sports, people talk about bringing up your A game, right? During an on-site interview, now you get on-site interview, it's, it's how I say it's rare because you know you probably um, the fall off rate maybe is like fifty uh, percent, right, or like ninety uh, percent. So you, it's very rare to get an on-site interview, right? And you really want to bring up your A game, right? The definition of the A game 
means that you bring up the highest level of performance, right? You bring up, bring up your top attitude and your ability, right? Now, attitude and ability is two different things. That's why this talk is more about attitude. It's not about ability. You want more ability, you go and practice lead code, right? You go and do your technical practice. Now, mind hacking is one of the important things to do, right? When you're going for an interview, when we go for an interview, you don't want to be a lethargic. You want to be confident, right? You don't want to like, you know, go there like thinking you just got out of bed, your hair is messy, you go there, eyes half open. Maybe you have small eyes. Asians have small eyes. But you don't want to, you know, like, you want your eyes to be open, you want to be alert, right? <clears throat> now, you want to be able to take your A game to every single interview, every single day. Maybe you have two interviews in a day. You want to bring your best into both interviews. Now, it's very hard. I know it's very hard, right? It's very hard for you to want to do that. But there are ways, there are things you can do, okay, to improve, improve the way you stand, the way you speak, your composture at that point in time, right? You are what you think. If you enter your mindset, you know, that you're unsure, you're uncertain, it's going to reflect itself on your face, on your actions. If you are fidgeting, if you are, you know, like I used to do talks when I was uh, doing talks a couple of years back, I used to like sway a lot, you know, back and forth, right? Like you're, you're showing that you're uncertain, you're showing you're nervous. If you move your hands around, you have some fidgeting, you show that you are, are not confident, right? If you are confident, you would show it very clearly when you are talking to whoever, your, your interviewer, okay? You have to intentionally psych yourself. You want to bring about the best of yourself every single morning. Every single morning before you get on the train. I, I know in Singapore it's very easy to get negative thoughts, right? You can't get onto a train. TTT, door closed in front of you, sian. It's very easy to be, get sian. It's very easy to have negative thoughts every morning, right? You just shower, you step out of the house, you perspire. <laughs> right, sian. But don't bring this sianness into the interview room because your interviewer is in the aircon room the whole day. He's not sian. So you cannot be sian, right? You have to cite yourself to be either on the same page or better than the interviewer. Now, everyone does this differently, okay? You can scan this QR code over here. There's one article that talks about how different people I'm going to reference Tony Robbins later. Some of you are yeah, not a fan, you know, oh, it's a lot of hype and blah, blah, okay, whatever. Right, I'm just going to quote him because I find it effective, okay? No one paid me to quote him. No one, I didn't attend, I didn't pay for any of Tony Robbins' talks. I just happened to have the chance to listen to him on YouTube. I visited him once uh, in, during Salesforce. It's one of those mega events. Over many days, he just gave a talk over there. I just thought it was inspiring, right? And I start listening to his audiobooks and stuff like that. Everyone has a different way of bringing about their highest level of energy every single day, okay? Like you hear me talking loudly, not because of this microphone. With or without this microphone, I still talk loudly anyway, right? But I saw throat, so I prefer the microphone, <laughs> right? To bring about your best level of energy every day is number one, is because you want to make a change now. You have spent so much effort practicing you spend months doing lead code. Can you not ensure that you present the best during the interview? Not saying that you have to be worried about how you look during an interview, but you just need to have the mindset that you want to change. Like this quote from, uh, <clears throat> I, I forgot, one is Tony Robbins talks. It's like, whenever you want to make a change or improve something, in the first place is to prove it in your mental, emotional state. You must be in the right emotional state before you present yourself to people, right? Like, before I came here this morning, right, I was sleepy. Yeah, you know, like I only slept like two hours last night because I was doing these slides, but I'm not going to show you my sleepy state, right? It's not going to do us any good for me being sleepy up here, right? You guys won't be happy. Imagine like speaking to you, you know, like really softly and bored without energy. Without energy, you guys are probably going to fall asleep as well. Right, you have to be in the right state, okay, to show the interviewer that you are what you are, right? So Tony Robbins has this, uh, this method called priming. Now, I learned this not really because he told me <laughs> that, but because at a certain point in time when I was going through a lot of, I went to about 10 plus on-site interviews. It was very tiring, 
because number one, yeah, previously I mentioned, you know, you can't sleep. Before every interview, I can't sleep the previous night. Now when you have five interviews back to back, what does that mean? <laughs> you can't sleep for a whole damn week, right? So what do I have to do? I can't show my sleepy face over there. I have to drive like maybe half an hour, half an hour to an interview place. You don't want to get in an accident, okay? You really want to prime yourself. You, know, you want to prepare yourself every single morning before your interview, right? It help you fulfill your goals of the day, right? So Tony Robbins has this thing. Now, I agree it's complex. I didn't do, I'm just going to show this slide first because this is what he did. Later, I'll talk about what I did, which is slightly different, okay? He has like a morning ritual. He does this breathing exercise. You can go watch the YouTube uh, over there, okay? He expresses gratitude. Every morning, you spend one minute thinking about how thankful you are for things in this very day. You could be thankful that you woke up. You know, some people didn't wake up. I know it's very morbid, but it happens. Some people die in their sleep. Most people don't, but it happens. Right, you experience gratitude to the things that happened in your previous day. You survived your last interview. You are thankful that you have this opportunity to interview at a company you may have intentionally applied, not because you saw it on LinkedIn, but you intentionally applied because someone said it's a great company and they gave you a chance to interview there, right? You, he says about, he talks about, you know, you want to experience a connection, a connection to yourself, right? Understand yourself, feeling yourself, that, you know, you are, uh, he, he talks about, like, oh, you feel a light flowing through you. I, I, I don't have that, so I can't really talk much, much about that. <clears throat> this point, visualize success. You have to visualize where you want to be before you can get there. You can't get to where you are without knowing where you want to go, right? Some books say, begin with the end in mind. I want to be a full-time developer in company X. Why do I want to be there? How do I get there, right? How do I get there? Visualize in your mind, you're going to be every day going to this office, nine to five, or maybe in Singapore, eight to six, I don't know. Um, you know, you want, you want to be visualizing that, but you're not going to just be a developer or a full stack engineer over here. You visualize what you will do when you're there. You could be teaching, you could be solving problems that are important. You could be giving great presentations about a new architecture you're going to present and you're going to impress someone over there, right? You have to visualize that after you get this job, this is what you'll be doing, okay? He basically has an intensive workout every morning. It is kind of hard to have an intensive workout in the morning or else you'll sweat buckets over here uh, and you maybe feel breathless and tired. I don't know. Um, yeah, and he takes this thing called a cold plunge. I'll talk more about this later, okay? By jumping into cold water, by jumping into cold water, you give yourself a shock. Now, most people, you wake up sleepy. What's the easiest way of, to stop being sleepy? Pour cold water on yourself or someone pour it on your face. I don't know, <laughs> right? He takes a cold plunge and uh, he hangs himself upside down. It's a bit extreme, I know. Most of us can't hang ourselves upside down at home. Yeah, our parents are like, ask you, eh, <laughs> right? you today have to Right? So, but yeah, you can try this. No, maybe it works, right? So what I do, okay, is a simplified, is a more, uh, how would I say, parental friendly version of this, okay? So pre-morning ritual, okay? A cold shower is very important. Now, you think in Singapore, all of you, okay, how many of you uh, have a cold shower in the morning already? Can you raise your hands in the morning? Oh yeah, quite a number of you. Because in the morning, uh, it's like freaking like uh, 28 degrees Celsius and a cold shower really means room temperature shower. It's not cold, <laughs> right? Okay, in the US, cold shower means 10 degrees Celsius water, right? Because, because out there at night, at night is really cold, right? Yeah, it's, probably, it's probably heated at home. And a shower over there really means not turning on the heated water. It really means pouring cold 5, 10 degrees Celsius water in your face. Okay? And do that every single day. Like I said previously, pain. Yeah, you may think cold is painful. But then you, you need to realize that cold is really in your mind. You feel cold. Doesn't mean you can't stand cold. You won't die. You won't die feeling cold. Have, have you heard of anyone who died feeling, who died from a cold shower. You die from hypothermia if you fall into a frozen lake, but you don't die from a cold shower. A cold shower will only benefit you because it gives you a shock. 
it gives you a shock. It tells you to wake the F up, right? There's no better way than that, except maybe someone slapping you in the face, but uh, not everyone does that, okay? I do this thing called mirror reflection. You know, like you brush your teeth every day in the morning. It's a chance. It's a chance for this thing called a, a mirror of accountability, like previously in uh, David Goggins' book. He talks about mirror of accountability. You look at yourself every single day, and you tell yourself what you want to achieve, what you want to be better. I know it sounds intense, but it's just, a, it's just something that you do. It's free. You know what's the best, of, the best thing about all these things? It's free. You don't have to pay money for it. You don't have to pay a freaking trainer for it. You don't have to pay a fitness trainer. If you go to a gym, you pay a fitness trainer some, some crazy amount of dollars that it doesn't make sense. You could watch a YouTube video. But some people say, oh, I need a you know, fitness trainer. He motivates me. That's because you're not motivated yourself to be fit in the first place. That's why I need a freaking fitness trainer, right? So you can be your own motivation in the morning. Just stare yourself in the mirror. You look at a person in the mirror. Are you happy with him? I may not be happy with myself every single morning. You look at yourself, that sad face, you know, so sian, sian face again. But can you not be sian? Yes, you can. You can choose to feel different every morning. Right? Okay, this thing called screaming. Okay? Now, you can scream in pain. <laughs> now, I, I mean screaming positively on a positive note. Have you ever screamed positively in your life? Like, you know, like, yeah, you get it. You can do it. Right? You can do it. Okay, you can do it. It sounds weird. It sounds weird. But I tell you, it's free. You can scream at yourself every single morning. Right? You can scream at yourself, reminding yourself of a time that you were happy. Maybe you get, uh, you get an A in class for some test or some some very lame reason. Maybe you won, uh, you capture a Pokemon, you play Pokemon Go a lot. Yeah, you capture like, you know, you know, top Pokemon or whatever, you're really happy, right? You scream in happiness, right? Screaming allows you to elevate your heartbeat, right? It allows you to put into a mindset. It reminds you, it links you back to the point in time where you felt successful, right? If you get a promotion, you'll be screaming internally. But I'm saying don't. Don't, don't hide your scream. You are yourself in your toilet. Scream as loud as you want, right? Your neighbors may think you are crazy. Oh my God, this guy, every morning, right? <laughs> screaming in front of a toilet. That's because you're staying in a HDB flat. Maybe in future, you'll be staying in a landed property. Stop thinking that you'll be stuck in a pigeon hole forever. Why did I move to the US? Because I want to stay in a proper house where I scream every morning and no one can hear me scream. <laughs> right? If you scream in a forest and no one hear you scream. Did you really scream? No one cares. No one judges you. You think, you, okay, <clears throat> another thing is that you think people judge you because you do that. But I tell you, people don't. <clears throat> people just think that, oh, you know you shave and you cut yourself. That's why you're screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, right? I mean, shit happens. But if it happens every morning, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just something you have to do. If it's something you have to do to ensure you have a positive mindset, just do it. Right? Visualize a persona. This is very important. You know, I grew up, um, but I grew up, okay, seeing many people, uh, many people on TV. Bill Gates is one of them, okay? You always think that, oh, how on earth did he, like, code an operating system and became very successful, blah, blah, blah. Visualize a persona. It can be a successful person. It can be a non-existent person. You, anyone watch anime over here? Watch anime, great. You know, in anime, what do they do? Naruto, when he wants to fight, he screams, right? Yeah! He powers up. When, oh, oh, who watched Dragon Ball? Dragon Ball, you know, you have that uh, thing, you're on fire, right? You're on fire. Visualize that moment when you are going to fight someone, when you're going to battle. Every interview is a battle. Every interview is a war, right? Every, every situation is a war. Visualize that you're going to battle. You can visualize yourself in future you can visualize a successful self visualize who you want to be because when you visualize who you want to be and your interviewer sees you you may not realize it right but you portray it that's why i say you look into the mirror and when you visualize who you want to be you act out who you want to be now, now many of you guys are not actors right you do, do is anyone an actor over here <laughs> no try to learn some acting now you don't have to but I'm quite sure you guys do stupid shit in front of the mirror when you're like by <coughs> yourself, right? You guys do stupid shit, you know? You, uh, 
I don't know, you look at your own muscles, you think, wow, I look very strong. You look at yourself, you think you look very pretty, right? Maybe for ladies, you put on makeup, you look at yourself every single time you put on makeup, right? You notice that that's a practice, that putting on makeup is a ritual. Every single time you do it, right? Some, some females tell me that they feel confident when they put on makeup. I understand why. Every single time you do it, you look at yourself, you think you're prettier, you look more confident. You are prettier, right? But you just basically, the very act of doing it makes you more confident. Guys don't put on makeup, but you shave or you don't shave. There's a benefit of leaving a beard when you go to an interview. You look senior, <laughs> right? This, this happened in the US. You know, you know one of the greatest like, problems with Asians in the US is like, you have no beard. Or not everyone has you know, uh, sufficient, like I have, I have quite a bit of beard if I don't shave for one week. You know, I have like a full beard all the way from like chin to chin, right? Many Asians in the US don't have the benefit of having a beard, so you lose out to your other American counterparts, right, who have a beard, but they're 20, 24 years old. They're 24 years old and it's November and they're interviewing and they didn't shave. And it looks like they're freaking like 30 years old. Oh yeah, I have like a five years experience. And <laughs> yeah, sounds very convincing, right? You have to act the role. Act the role. If you want to be experienced, you have to look experienced. Don't wear a blazer. Don't wear suit and tie when you interview, right? Visualizing yourself also means that you wear dress for the occasion. Wear t-shirt and jeans, right? Wear like, you go, if you know a company culture, like GovTech, many people there just wear t-shirt and jeans. Then you wear t-shirt and jeans for interview. My ke kiang, right? Don't, you don't think that you dress very nice, huh? you wax your hair until very, you know, sucky, right? Then you don't, then you think the, the interviewer is impressed by you? No. You are still going to screw up your white body interview, right? And this person is going to have a, possibly a terrible impression. Yeah, people who dress up, uh, sure cannot make it one, uh, right? But don't do that, right? Be comfortable. Don't overdress. You are comfortable in t-shirt and jeans. Just remain comfortable in t-shirt and jeans. Of course, common sense, don't wear slippers, right? Respect your interviewer. But just be normal, right? Just be normal, okay? Be like every other person who is hired in that company for a start. Okay? When you visualize yourself, this important point, have gratitude. It's important to thank people in your life. You know, be thankful for, uh, for the chance the interviewer has given you to interview there. Be thankful that you're even there on time. Okay? Be thankful that the interviewer turned up on time. Like some interviewers are super slack. They are like always late. They give a bad impression. But never mind. You know, just thank him. You know, uh, thanks for interviewing me today, right? Uh, you know, I've looked at your company um, for a while. Uh, my friend introduced it to me. You know, he said many great things. You know, I would definitely like to have an opportunity over here, right? By having gratitude, you know, by thanking the small things in life, it resonates well with whoever you are speaking to, okay? Now, this is one of the things uh, I find important. I have to strongly emphasize vocal exercises. Many of you do not pronounce well, okay? And that is a problem. If your interviewer is going to hear you, like, you know, singing like J. Joe and like uh, mumbling and rumbling, rambling away, right? He's not going to understand what the heck you're saying. He's going to ask you to repeat multiple times. He may mishear what you're saying as something else. It just comes across as inconfident. So the very basic thing about speaking, it's just enunciating your words, speaking clearly. One of the things I learned when I moved to the US is I learned to speak clearly. If I speak like I was like uh, 10 years ago, no one will understand me, no one will understand what I'm saying over there, right? So I speak clearly. So early in the morning, when you are showering, when you are screaming, now screaming also allows you to enlarge your lungs. You have the, now you have your diaphragm expanded, you can have the force to uh, put voice out of your mouth, right? You want to stretch your vocal cords. Stretching your vocal cords is important if you want to not speak monotonously and in a single tone, right? You want to be able to speak with enthusiasm, to speak with, you know, in a kind of attractive fashion. I mean, you can choose whatever you want to do, <clears throat> right? Stretching your vocal cords means like going all the way from low, from low uh, tone all the way to a, as high as a tone as you can, right? 
it's like singing. I actually learned some of these principles from singing because, yeah, I don't know. I tend to sing in the bathroom, so uh, yeah, it just happened. <laughs> okay, vowels. Uh, A E I O U. Pronounce your vowels clearly, right? Pronounce your vowels clearly. It also helps that your interviewer has a good impression of you speaking, right? Definitely, if you, especially if your interviewer is not a local, right? You know, maybe it could be, uh, let's say, Stripe uh, created an office in Singapore. From the US, they flew many of their tech people over from the US. Or Facebook, they fly people from the US to Singapore to interview you, right? So you have to pronounce properly. Drop your Singlish, right? Yeah, some people say, oh, yeah, Singlish is like Singapore pride, blah, 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 whatever, right? You're going to get a job. You're not talking about upholding your pride over here, right? <laughs> Speak clearly, right? Enunciate your vowels, S and T's. Pronounce your S and T's. Right? I think the British like to say, pronounce your S and T's and drink your T's. But yeah, okay. So that's about personal prepping. Um, the other prep tips in interviews. Now remember the goals you mentioned earlier. Okay? Keep all these goals in mind. Keep all these goals in mind because they will be useful to you when you are speaking to the interviewer. They'll be useful to you in the questions you ask. Okay, convert them into actionables. For every goal you have, figure out what you are going to do in an interview that makes it different. Now, an interview is a chance for you to spend time with someone in the company. Right? You may have friends in the company, you ask them questions, sure. But you have time with your interview from the company. You can ask the most weird questions that you think many people wouldn't ask. Right? Like you want to find a value of a company, just straight up ask them, what justifies your valuation of like $1 billion today? Maybe you are going to carousel or whatever, right? Just ask them straight out, you know, what do you think of your valuation today? Do you think it would increase in future? What are you doing to increase the valuation of a company or to keep it there, right? Execute during the interviews, ask hard questions. Maybe you'll fail to, fail to do this. Ask hard questions to your interview. Now, treat it as an exercise, right? Your interviewer gave you a hard time, ask you all the hard questions on a whiteboard that you, you know, probably freaked out or not, okay? Ask hard questions to the interviewer, right? One of the hard questions they like to ask, why did your company choose this tech stack? Let's say it's using Ruby on Rails, right? You could be aware of maybe uh, some terrible coding practices on Ruby on Rails or maybe uh, C Sharp. So could you explain to me why did your company use C Sharp? Why is everyone doing this? There's no right or wrong answer. He's supposed to give you an honest answer. If he gives you bullshit, you call him out on it, right? Or you call him out, you know, internally, you just keep it in your heart, you know, right? Okay, in your interview, um, it's very important to CSI as much as, much as possible. Any one of you here camp on EDMW forum? Uh, hardware zone? No, really? Okay, a couple of you. <clears throat> yeah, stalking on LinkedIn is one thing. Now, later I'll show you a very large Excel sheet of all the different properties that I find out about our company. B, tariff, okay? You're making a life decision. It's like marrying a partner or whatever. You want to CSI as much as you can about that person. I, either like, you know, in, in secretly or uh, directly, right? You should definitely check out all of their like C-level people. Now, many people think that, oh, management leadership is like whatever, you know, it's like, it's not really important. I tell you, it's important, okay? It's very easy for technical people to forget that management, there's so much more to a company other than a good tech stack. Yeah, I mean, you can have a good tech stack, you know, like uh, very good coding practices, blah, blah, blah. But if the business fail, you fail. And sometimes business will fail, not because of technical problems. More than often, it fails because of business problems. I say that from experience, right? As a technical person, for some reason, technical problems are so straightforward. It's actually like one of the easier things, okay, that can be, that is done in the company. It's, it's, it's kind of easy because it's straightforward, it's finite. It's finite. There's always a solution to, uh, more than always, a solution to every problem. But in business, there may not be a solution to every problem. You could go downhill because of internal issues, C-level issues, if, uh, if the CEO, or the CFO screws up, run out of money, right? If uh, you spend too much money on a golden toilet bowl or a golden tap in your office, mm -hmm. something's wrong. You want to catch all these warning, later I'll have a slide about the uh, warning, warning signs, red flags, right? You want to catch all these things during your interview. Your interview is not about you. 
The interview is really you finding out about the company, finding out about the team. Okay? Check out everyone in the team that you know who's going to interview you. Check them out on LinkedIn. Okay? Search for everyone on LinkedIn. Okay? Search by the company name. Right? So you can find everyone who's working there. Check Glassdoor. Check every source you can to look for red flags, things that you feel uncomfortable with. Ask hard questions like, uh, in Singapore, not so much, but in the US, you know, it's like, um, some, some people in the LGBTQ community will ask like, oh, uh, what do you, what do you, how do you handle diversity around your, what, your uh, what is the company's stance on diversity? You know, these kinds of questions. Ask the hard questions, right? How do you handle engineering management over here? Okay, check out the background, look out in the news, check out all the rounds they raised, one of the things I like to tell people is that a good company never stops raising money. Okay? Even if they're profitable, they should ideally be raising money every two years. I won't go into the details of the story for another day. Okay? But a company which stops raising money or stops doing like uh, financial pushes to increase their valuation, something's wrong. Right? Okay? Think about why they're hiring for your position, for any position. Have you ever looked at, anyway, apply for a job, like full stack developer or something? Have you ever checked, do you have a role for non full stack developers? <laughs> like pure backend, pure front end, iOS, Android, blah, blah, blah. How about finance? Are they, for some reason, hiring finance? Are they hiring a country rep in another country? Right? Ask these questions. Why are they hiring? Because why their business direction is important. Okay? Because you want to be doing things in a growing company. You don't want to be doing things in a stagnating company. You're going to spend a tangible amount of time of your life in that company. You want to make sure they're doing something tangible. They're progressing. Okay? Now, all these things I said, yeah, some of you may think, oh, yeah, it's bullshit. I'm not going to scream in the mirror every morning. Okay? But just ask yourself this one question. All these things are free. It doesn't take out a lot of time. Is there anything you wouldn't do to ensure that you will get the best job or the best change that you will possibly spend your entire life. Now, this is not just about this one job. It's about your next, next job. It's about yourself, how you carry yourself forward from this point onwards, right? It's how you carry yourself from this point onwards through employment, through outside employment, through the rest of your life, okay? Now, week four uh, decisions. Now, Many of you think that, uh, like, okay, you join a company, oh, I get an offer, it sounds great, let's just sign right there and get to it. Not so simple. Now, it's not, it's, it can be simple for, if you don't have, like, strong expectations, you know, like, oh, I just want a job, I need to eat, you know, your Maslow needs are, like, at the bottom level, right? <laughs> so, yeah, sure, that's very easily satisfied, okay? But very often, if you are driven, if you want to be driven, you want to get somewhere in life, you have to make hard decisions. You have to often make decisions where you don't know where's the right or wrong answer. If you are presented with two jobs, same pay, same pay, same salary, same benefits, same number of days of leave per year, or none or no counting at all, how do you make a decision from there? Okay. <clears throat> now, interviews goes both with the first step of making a decision that I mentioned previously. Ask hard questions. You know, find out um, as much as you can. Okay? Now, remind, remember my emphasis on personal goals. It's very important. Everyone has different personal goals. Some are financial. Some are managerial. Some want the title director in their title. I don't know why, but titles matter to some people. I respect that. It's reasonable depending which country you're from or which ecosystem you are from. Okay? Personal goals are important because you want to meet them. You want to have personal Satisfaction. Company culture is important. Now, some people think, oh, company culture is changes over time. Maybe it's not that much of a factor. I leave it to you to decide. Right? But at the very least, do the best you can to find a culture that you like or can live with. Can you live with a 996 culture? Is it, is it 996 or 966? I can't remember. 996. Must be 996. Uh, it's the bigger number. Right. <laughs> right. Can you? What's that? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Or some, some, some extraordinary number, uh, number of work hours a week. Some people may say that that's acceptable. Okay. Some of you may not. I mean, it's not for me to judge. Right. But figure out the work company culture they have. 
Do they have flexible leave policy? Do they allow you, if you plan to start a family, right, uh, what is their stance on uh, family friendliness? I know that family friendly companies are kind of lacking in this part of the world, but they'll get there, right? If we ask, if we expect it to happen, it would happen sooner or later. Right, that's what happened in the Valley. I'm sure that many years ago, family friendliness is not been part of their plan. The bigger companies can do it, and gradually it becomes a norm. It becomes an expectation. Right? Your way of life is often more important than your job. It's irony. But I'm going to tell you that your life is more important than your job. Right? Because a job is just a job. But you have your own goals in life. And you make sure the company culture supports those goals. If you have the option, I, I know not everyone can have the flexibility or you know, have those opportunities, but you try. You try your best to, end, to get what you want, right? Expectations, salary expectations, um, expectations of job duties. Some companies hire for one role, uh, or I'm going to hire for iOS, and suddenly you realize that, hey, why am I like, building a whole damn product? <laughs> It happens, right? It happens. Um, maybe you know, in teams that are not that well organized, they are short of people. They tell you, oh, be flexible and do all these things. Not saying it's wrong. Not saying it's wrong. It's all about expectations, right? Are you willing to do that? Are you prepared to do that? Are you prepared to ask more, for more salary if that happens? Okay? Team size is important. Team size dictates a lot on how things are being done. If, you're, if you have a team size of one, uh, you can say that, oh yeah, I'm a team lead of myself and this other guy. It's not really a team. I mean, yeah, you have your title. If your goal is to have a title, sure, you can have a team lead title of one. <laughs> right. Some people, like, I was looking for a larger company because I wanted a larger team. Okay? I want a larger team because like, it drives me to basically learn how to manage people well. Manage people well is hard. It's a story for another day. But I say it uh, requires a different mindset from coding every single day. You can code every single day, you know, you can do your stuff well, but to ensure that five, pe five other people working with you do their stuff well as well is different. If 10 other people have to meet your expectations, it's different. It's hard. And it's often not about technical skill, but it's a story for another day. It's often not about technical skill. It's a lot about interpersonal skills and so on, right? So team size, okay? A larger team size also means a larger, no, larger teams, um, no, larger number of teams also mean potentially, right, your, the, the leg work you need to do to roll out a change in the product is lesser. In some smaller companies, if you have to make a change, you have to do everything from back end to front end to provisioning servers or AWS, whatever, right? But in, Larger companies with larger teams, more teams, you could potentially have an easier time. You could provision things much easier. If you need like some resources, someone will give it to you. Oh, I need logging. I need, um, you know why some people say that larger companies are more comfortable to work with? They have support. They have proper support and organization. They have proper support and organization of features, tools you need for development. Tooling is important. Tooling means you can get your work done faster. Right? Tooling means you tear out your hair lesser because something screws up. Tooling means you can ask someone to take care of their problem when their stuff breaks. A growth mindset okay, means that growth mindset is really about like, do you think the company have what it takes to grow financially, personally? Are they supportive of your personal growth? Your personal growth no, is not just financially, but are you able to do things that are non-technical as well. Are you able to better handle people of different, uh, of different problems? Uh, you know, software engineers have this thing where, I'm not sure many of you are familiar with, but many engineers have weird personal problems. Some of them, you know, like common debate, tabs and spaces. That's actually the simplest problem. <laughs> there are other problems, like, I want to do things my way, or my, I think my way is better than the other person thinks, oh no, I think my way is better, and they start quarreling and arguing until the cows come home, but there's no, sometimes there's no right answer, but you need to handle such situations, right? How do you tell someone that what he's doing is not ideal? You have a better way of doing things. How do you present 
a better way of doing things without offending the shit out of the other person. Some people are super defensive. You no, know? it's like, I built this system, it's mine, right? It's like I built a wall around it. The guy may sound like Donald Trump, hopefully not. But how do you tell him there's a better way of doing things without, <clears throat> without agitating him? Right? These are things you have to learn on the job. I can't really tell you now. Maybe some people can tell you. I can't really tell you over here. Okay. C-level questions. I think I covered this earlier. You know, ask hard questions to the CEO, CFO, CTO. Okay. Very often, the upper management is the one with the vision. It sounds cliche, I know. Yeah, the one with the vision. You, you think vision is fluffy. But in a large organization, vision is important. There's a, there are many people that you probably have seen Steve Ballmer jumping around on stage, right? You think whatever he's doing is terrible, but he does it for a reason. He does it to motivate his people. As a third party, you may think it's stupid, but if it works, it works. If he shows results for it, it's fine. It doesn't matter. He moves on. He doesn't care what you think, right? He only cares what his people think. Right, ask hard C-level questions. If you think that the C level people are not inspiring. If you're, so I had this bad interview experience uh, with someone, I wouldn't really say who, because more than 10 years ago, you know, this director of something was a, I mean, it's kind of a person who, when he was, I was talking to him, I went down to the office. He sounds really sien. He's like the director of technical stuff, and he's like, you know, talking in a monotonous voice. And as uh, I wasn't, I was looking for internship at the point in time, right? I was wondering, like, why does he feel so bored? <laughs> Okay, well, if, if he, as a director level, is feeling so bored, what would I think of the people working with him? <laughs> right? Am I going to go with a bunch of people who are passionate about the work? Or am I going to go with a bunch of people who are just going in 9 to 5, right, just grinding away without life motivation? I don't know. I mean, it's your choice, but I'm looking for people who are motivated to work with, that I want to go to work to see every day, I want to go to work to meet such people, to debate, to interact with every day. So ask the hard questions. <clears throat> no funding rounds, valuation, expansion plans. Okay. Now, I end this slide because um, engineering management is more than Does anyone know what an engineering manager is? Okay, most of you don't seem to know what engineering manager is, but in many places in the US, um, engineering manager basically takes care of engineers. Okay, now many of you think that a manager is your, your boss. Oh my God, I'm like, I must be, you know, please the person. I must like show my best. No. An engineer, engineering manager handles your career progression. He tells you what to do what you should do, what you shouldn't do. He tells you what are the expectations of the company. He tells you he's more like a mentor, right? Engineering manager is really more like a mentor. He's someone who would help you learn how to, how to interact with your co-workers. Many of us may not know how to interact with your co-workers. Have you ever met like people, you know, software engineer developers who are like so reclusive, always with their large headphones, um, they speak, you know, you know, you find it really hard to talk to them. That's fine, that's normal. They're learning as well, right? Engineering manager is supposed to help them improve as a person, okay? Very often, many small companies um, have stagnation. Stagnation means that you work in a job. You don't know what it takes to promote. Hence, you don't promote. And you may think it's fine, it's there. You get to do your, your, your comfortable little bubble. You stay there and you stagnate. So maybe uh, 10 years later, you still, you know, you leave the company and you realize that Shit, I'm still doing like, uh, I'm still on the LAMP stack, doing like PHP, MySQL, whatever. And everyone has moved on to newer technologies, building larger stuff. But you're still like in the 1990s, right? You need to have a career progression. You, have you heard of levels? Levels, engineering levels. You know that as a career progression, many people think that you must be a manager, right? I don't know, in Singapore, many people tell you, oh, after uh, being a whatever engineer, next step is manager. No, that's not the case, right? You should have a path to remain as an engineer, as a sole contributor, because you like to build stuff, because you like to architect stuff, right? Do you think architect who draw, drafts up a building 
is you know really like a taking care of a bunch of a room for people. Hey, you do this, you do that. No. He draws the grand plan of things and works with his team, right, to design an entire building. Right? He's really an independent contributor because he doesn't need to care about what his team members need to do to promote. No, he doesn't care about that. He cares about technical aspects, right? He's a technical, you can say he's a technical lead. You should be able to go down a technical track if you choose to do so. If you choose, if you think you are better at managing people, you should be able to choose to be a manager. Learn how to be an engineering manager, right? Okay, different companies have different ladders, different like promotion tracks. Clear promotion tracks ensures you have to go, you have a goal. You have a personal set of goals. You look at a company, if they have different tracks, you're able to ideally fit your goals with the company's goal. And that's like the ideal situation. Now I know not everyone has the opportunity to do that, but know they exist and you want to move towards that. Right. I recommend looking at this website, progression.fyi. Okay, it's um not sure of a QR code, no, no QR code. Um, so it's a website that basically tells you what many other companies, Spotify, Netflix, LinkedIn, blah, 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 okay, they have clear promotion ladders. So that number one, the people are not lost, you're not clueless, you know that you're not stuck in a data end job, you have promotional, pro, uh, uh, promo, promotional prospects. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about this fun part, okay. Common red flags. Um, Okay, I'll talk to some of you. This interested interviewer. You know, you talk to an interviewer like I have, you know, he's like, he seems super sian. I mean, come on, he's like director level. I know he drives to work. You don't take an MRT. How can you be more sian than me, right? Okay, maybe you're stuck in a jam. I don't know. But at least, you know, you're in a car with music. Um, okay, you have an interviewer that is totally disinterested. That gives you a bad vibe. How does he carry his team? Is his team like that? Is, it, is that the company culture, right? You don't want to be in that kind of terrible situation, you know, where you accept the job. You think, you may think that, oh, maybe just, you give him discount, right? Yeah, maybe just this person, he's, yeah, he has a bad day. I say, no, it's not just that he has a bad day. He's just not primed to interview, he's not prepared to interview you, right? And if he is like that, okay, how is he going to carry forth the rest of his team? Overpromising. Some interviewers are too primed. They're like so excited, they want to tell you every single thing. You know, life is great. You know, I, when I was an intern, I was a, still an undergraduate, I was going to intern at a company. I won't say which company, but it's a super large company in Singapore, started with S, okay? Um, and they do all kinds of government contracts, not Singapore power, fortunately, right? And it, it was just one of the options, you know, and it's like, uh, I don't know, they were like selling me all kinds of things. They're telling me, oh, they do all kinds of uh, interesting projects. They're telling me, oh, that stuff is great. Their pantry is great. But I need a little tea over there. How is that great? You know, tell me all kinds of things. You know, he keeps selling the company. You know, if the person keeps selling the company, something is wrong. Have you ever seen an insurance agent try to sell you all the plans? Something is wrong. The person just wants you in, right? It's not, it's kind of, it feels kind of weird. Okay? Maybe they don't have enough people joining them. I don't know, but it's a red flag to me. I don't know about you, right? Maybe you'll take it, it's fine. You can join such companies. Nothing too wrong about going with someone who overpromises, but it's a red flag, okay? Overselling, um, you know, if someone promises you all kinds of benefits, like uh, some employers say, oh, you'll get mentorship from certain senior developers, you'll get involved in this and that. Uh, I would say that until you actually see it, don't buy into it too much, right? Um, do your homework. Like I said, nothing beats doing your own homework. CSI, LinkedIn, talking to, you know what's the thing that freaks out the HR person the most, okay? Is if you start saying that at the end of the interview, oh yeah, I have a friend over here, let me go say hi to him. <laughs> so it means that after he sells you all this shit, oh, you actually know what's going on already. The person may like, oh shit, you know, have I said something that's like not true? Right? Okay? Definitely, either pretend you're a friend there or not, right? Go and talk to existing people over there. If you get to go in a lunch meeting, um, you find someone approachable, you know, ask them, go say hi. Talk to people, okay? Talk to people and find out things that people don't want you to find out. Some companies in the US, they are very open. They bring you to a lunch uh, interview, or not really, it's more like just bring you lunch, and they just see you with a whole table of like six different people. 
I think that's great. They show openness in communicating. You know, ask whatever you want. You know, ask about the unhappy things you know, that uh, people face, what are the drawbacks. Just be honest. I think that the rarest, most valuable thing a company can give you is honesty. Right? I, I've had companies you know, telling me that oh, you know, their runway is only about a year and a half. Right? There's nothing shameful about saying that after a year and a half, you may be out of a job. But in some startups, that's the truth. Right? And if you want to join a startup, that's fine. And you should appreciate the honesty that they are being upfront with you. They are not hiding that you know, they are not very well funded. It's fine. You choose your own risk level. Clueless interviewer. Yeah. Someone asked me about what if your interviewer doesn't know what, you know what role you're interviewing for. I say that person is just freaking unprepared. Probably haven't even read the interview brief or even your LinkedIn probably doesn't know about what you do, right? I'll say just give this person a downvote, right? Um, every single interviewer should know what they're doing, right? If you are being clueless, you're wasting the interviewer's time, you're wasting your time, you're wasting the company's time if you're being clueless, right? There's no excuse to being clueless. There's little excuse in being late for your interview. It goes both ways, both the interview and the interviewee. Sarcasm. Uh, I was interviewing at a company, right, starting with M in Singapore for internship position. I tell you, that was like the worst interviewer I've ever met. You know, it's like it makes you like, he starts telling you like, oh, yeah, you know, like you can get started right away, you know, like, uh, you, know, um, you know, yeah, we'll start like moving forward uh, next week, blah, blah, blah. And later it tells you you're not selected, right? And yeah, at that moment, you know, you feel like you're kind of happy. It's like, oh, wow, is it really moving that fast? But no, that guy's just shitting you. He's just shitting you because, I don't know, he thinks he's in a superior position. He feels that he can, right? Give a negative score to such people immediately. Don't hesitate. If this person is going to do this to you because you're an interviewee, imagine what he'll do to you if he's your teammate, if, you're, if he's your boss, right? I've heard of terrible horror stories around here in some companies where you have bosses which are like, you know, all high up on their horses, right? They think they're great. They think they are, you know, like you're like, you like noobs, okay, to, you know, to, to be able to vent their frustration on, right? Don't work with such people. It's a toxic environment, full stop. Um, some companies like to give you an excessively long take-home exercise. Oh, can you build like this? Can you build a, a clone of Uber? Let's say if you are interviewing for iOS developer position. Right, it gives you a little write-up. Here are these uh, here are the requirements. Can you build like Uber clone? Right, uh, no, there's no time limit. You know, let me know when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell them the F off, seriously. Just tell them the F off. There are better options. I tell you my limit on take-home exercises. Three hours shouldn't exceed more than five for backend exercises. Shouldn't be more than five API endpoints or whatever. Frontend exercise shouldn't be more than one, one to three pages tops. No, don't ask for some super, you know, like a, a lot of like content or like a lot of features on it. If they give you a template, even better, right? Learn how to use whatever uh, template that they are company use. I think that's okay, but it shouldn't be too tedious, right? Some people ask for the moon, push back. You have the right to push back. Tell him, no, you will not do this. I, I've, had, I've had companies, right, that have done a take-home exercise in the US. Now, some are kind of like tedious because it's like in C, in C, C++, you have to code, have to code some low-level stuff. Now, I tell him that this is an interesting exercise, and I'll just do it for the sake of doing it because it's actually interesting. It's something that I've not done before, so I'll do it. But in any other case, if it's like something you've done before, you see it's a waste of time, just tell me it's a waste of time. You can find other candidates. Move on. Of course, it depends how desperate you are, but usually you're better off moving on. Usually. Time-based culture. <clears throat> Many companies, you know, um, like they want you to come in before like 9 a.m., you know, and if you are interviewing a company, try your best to stay until 6 p.m. and compare how many people are there at 6 p.m. compared to at lunch. And you'll, you'll see yourself in that chair in the future, right? So you see a culture where the entire company is there doing serious. If they have meetings at 6 p.m., run. <laughs> Meeting at 6 p.m., who the heck do that shit, right? You guys have no life, no family. 
Okay? If you accept, if people accept such a culture, it becomes the norm. So if you don't want it to be, to be the norm, don't accept such a culture. If people think that sitting at a table is being productive, maybe some of you think it is, but it's wrong, right? Software people have their own flow. I mean, if you have been, you know, many of you don't sit at the computer for a long time, but if you do, you realize that there are points in time where you want to sit for long periods of time, you are super productive, and when past a certain point in time, you just can't get on, you just get off your chair, go get a drink, go stare, stare in the, at green stuff or something. That's fine, that's normal. Okay, some uncommon red flags. Uncommon red flags, um, this through personal experience, the toilet test. I believe how well you take care of your toilet is how well you take care of your company and how well you take care of your people. Okay, if you can't take care of your toilet well, you're probably paying the cheapest toilet cleaner. Right, you have people in your company who squat on the seats. I don't know if that still exists today, but used to be, right? If you people in a company who don't know how to have a clean toilet, they probably can't keep the company running well, okay? Ranking on a scale of zero to Japan. <laughs> if your toilet has a billet, you know, I, I just say just, 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 just sign up already, right? <laughs> right, if your toilet looks like a hawker center toilet, uh, yeah, might want to reconsider. You probably have a very tiny desk as well. Okay, the pantry test. I'll say to a software engineer, so the pantry is one of the more important underlooked things. Now, ma many people tell me like, oh, a pantry, you can't judge a, a company by a pantry. We are frugal. Frugal, heck, even Amazon has a pantry. Even Amazon has free bananas, right? Frugal is a very dangerous word. It can go both ways, okay? It can mean that a company thinks about you or a company is shortchanging you. You can be frugal and say, that, yeah, you shouldn't drink Coke, you should drink water, yes. Maybe that's true. Or they just have no money to buy anything than a water dispenser, right? The pantry test is important because you need to see if there's shared food. You know, a company which people, staff, co-workers bring food to share each other, right? I think it's a company that is positive. People collaborating with each other, people working, actually working with each other, right? Shared food is in the pantry, food in the refrigerator. Let's say you bring your lunch. I don't know if people do around here. In the US, we bring food. We put in the refrigerator, food, food in the refrigerator. And it doesn't go missing. It means your co-workers don't steal your shit. <laughs> if there's no shared food in the fridge, it's a warning sign that people don't trust each other to have shared food around, right? So don't underlook shared. Of course, if you see spoiled food in the fridge, <laughs> okay, I don't know, man. Some questionable decisions of people back there. You probably have a rotten coat somewhere as well, okay? Coke Zero, it's weird. Some companies never have canned drinks in the office. I don't know, this is a personal heuristic. If I see Coke Zero in a company pantry, it's a thumbs up. Okay, it's a thumbs up, why? Coke is like the cheapest stuff you can buy. I mean, it's the cheapest thing that gives you a positive energy, it gives you some caffeine, you know, it, it's kind of sweet, whatever. And zero means no calorie, it means that they're concerned about their employees' health. That's why it's zero, right? It's not full of sugar, okay? Companies who don't put canned drinks in their fridge probably don't understand software engineers very well, <laughs> right? Okay, tea is important. Now these days I don't drink much coffee. Um, I don't know if you, all, you have experience with coffee, but it gives me like the, uh, the highs that are make you jittery, overhyped, and when it wears off, you crash. You crash like your head is on the keyboard. Right, yeah, but tea on the other hand, good tea keeps you going for a long time. On a scale of yellow Lipton, you know yellow Lipton is like the lowest grade, it's the cheapest shit you can find. Yeah. Right, if you see a, a company that only has yellow Lipton tea, leave. <laughs> Just leave, okay? Right, now this thing called, now there's probably other tea, if they have whole tea leaves, now I'm not gonna give a lecture about teas, Whole tea leaves. Do you guys go to uh, drink like Chinese tea? 
Now, I never really understood Chinese tea um, until I go to the US and start drinking more green tea. I realized that whole tea leaves are great. If you never have whole tea leaves in your whole life, you're missing out. Right? What do you grow up on? You grow up on Lipton tea, probably. <laughs> right? You think Lipton tea is the only thing around? Yeah. But where, what's better than tea leaves? This tea called yerba. If a company stocks cans of yerba tea, it's great because yerba tea is like the best instant tea thing around. Right? Because it gives you the energy, it doesn't give you the crash. You don't crash hard, you don't feel lethargic after it wears off. Right? It gives you, you know, like, it's, it's someone that, you know, like, uh, you get, you, it's, like, it's like driving like a, a Mercedes or a BM, right? It's smooth. It's smooth, right? Drinking Lipton tea is like driving a, a, a lower sand, a QQ cherry or something. It's like, it's just like so rough, right? It's functional, it's functional, no doubt, but it's rough. So if a company can appreciate yerba tea, right? They probably understand software engineers, okay? Do they hang out over beer? Now, I have this uh, heuristic, right? Uh, a boss or superior who doesn't drink beer, I think it's a warning sign. I think it's a warning sign, right? That the person is uptight. This person is uptight. He doesn't want to spend a small amount of money on uh, personal company well-being. People, you know, like, what do you, what do you call it? Um, co what do you call it? Cool. Yeah, company cohesion, cool. right? Like many people just want to like, if you drink beer, you probably have like an ability to like let loose, you know, like do shit, hang out together, talk about stuff, being able to be relaxed with your co-workers. You want to work in an environment which is positive, where people are just relaxed about each other and get stuff done, right? That's why I appreciate anyone, you know, who would buy each other a beer. So you will not probably have a chance to drink with your interviewers, definitely, but you can hear when you walk through an office, do you hear, you walk through an office at 5 p.m., do you hear people talking about going out for a beer, right? It's rare, but if you do, do hear about that, you know, extra brownie points for them, okay? Be judgmental. Now, many people say, oh, you've got to be kind, you've got to be, you know, forgiving. Yes, you do that for people to people, people to care about, but if you're going to make a serious decision in your life, okay, you've got to be judgmental. Now, as Singaporeans, we are probably finding it very easy. We judge people all the time. <laughs> right? You go away, you, look, you walk past a shopping mall, uh, you start judging, oh, that, that thing is like pretty so cheap. Right? It's on discount, it must be poor quality. Right? Um, but you've got to be judgmental for a company. It's okay to be judgmental for companies because given multiple choices, given multiple options, you want to get the best choice for yourself. Right? It affects you, not just you, your dependents, Many of you work to support your parents, your families, right? So you've got to make the right decision, okay? <clears throat> I always like to tell people this, you know, your life is uh, about 80 years, average expectancy, okay? Working two years at a company is 2.5%. You're going to spend 2.5% of your life working in a company. Six years is 7.5%, okay? It means that if you work at a 7.5%, imagine that how many percent of your life you spend sleeping compared to 7.5%, do you think it's tangible? And now if you take a look at, that's the whole working life. Now your actual working life is only about 40 years old, 40 years from 25 to 65, around there. Now, if you look at it this way, it's even worse, right? If you work at, for two years in a company, just, it's already 5% of your working life. You want to spend 5% of your working life in a shithole? You don't. You want to spend 5% of your life regretting? You're going to die of regrets. You know, like, you're probably one of those old, old guys on the deathbed. I regret working at X company. If you spend like six years of your life, six years of your working life is 15% of your working life. Right? Many, very often you see successful people in life. The reason they're successful is because they happen to make the right choices at every juncture. At every juncture you make a choice. They just happen to make the right choice. They're lucky, maybe. Or they make an informed decision. Company comparison sheet. This is important. Let me just uh, take a drink. Now this section I know is very dry. <clears throat> it's all important stuff.
if you um, would use your phone to open the QR code, I actually shared a very large uh, Excel on a Google spreadsheet, okay? It's, this comparison sheet is really about risk management. Assume you have two offers. So let's say you just have two offers. Or you have one offer. If you have one offer, you want to compare that offer with your current state you're in. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's better to be not employed than to be employed, right? At least you, man at least you maintain your mental sanity, not being employed, okay? <clears throat> okay, you want to evaluate quantitatively. I try to put everything in dollar value, everything in dollar value. You want to use online resources. All these online resources are what I have used, okay, to research about the companies that I want to join, okay? To know what to expect in terms of your compensation package, what is the norm, right? To know what is the norm between, within the company and between the company. I know the form is kind of small, so I'll do a quick run through of the spreadsheet. You can take your time to look at it now. I understand that not every part of this spreadsheet is applicable to you in the Singapore context, but you know, just take it with a pinch of salt, right? And know that you can calculate many things quantitatively. Okay, the font is too small. <laughs> yeah, um, but so let's let's go from the just just generally, you know, from the top over here. I mean, many many of the things that I uh, look over here, you know, definitely, right? We look at like base compensation, um, sign-on bonus. You know, is this it, it, in some companies? If you know a sign-on bonus exists, get it. It's free money. You know what they say about the difference between a sign-on bonus and asking for a higher salary? If you ask for a higher salary today, it's not gonna do very well in the long term. In the long term, many people are just going to be normalized. I mean, it varies from companies to companies, but for those that I heard of, they are being normalized. That means that over time, if your starting salary is high, your next increment will be lower, right? If your starting salary is lower, next increment will maybe say higher. It's just to normalize across the board. But if you take a sign-on bonus, it's a one-off cash in the pocket. I look at it as a compensation for your time spending to interview. It's, let's say if I spend my time, two months downtime, right, or four months, not interviewing, consider it as a bonus, you know, to make up for lost time not working, offset for your opportunity cost, okay? Definitely calculate taxes. Uh, Singapore, you have like tiered taxes. CPF is a form of tax. Definitely factor in the illiquid nature of amount of money going to CPF. Um, when you are offered stock options, or you should definitely ask for stock options if you think it's a norm. Ask for it and also evaluate it. The phone is a bit small here, but you know, definitely you want to know what are the prices, whether it's option or outright stock uh, given to you the various price that you are set up with because the price matters as to what is the potential gain in future. If the price is really high, you may think that, oh, you know, in future, the increment may be a lot smaller. Use the numbers you get to basically see how much percentage of the company you are getting. Some people are afraid to ask, well, what's the value of your company today, right? Just ask it. Just ask outright. The valuation. Ask for the numbers you need. Ask for how many outstanding stocks are there. Ask for how many percentage of the total pool you're going to get. Ask if the employee pool is being diluted when they have future value, uh, fund, uh, fundraising. Dilution means that your percentage will shrink, but sometimes it's okay because your value will increase you know, more than how much it shrank, blah, blah, blah. Okay, those are details you have to ask, right? There are many resources you can read online to basically figure out how to evaluate stocks, evaluate stocks and companies. You want to know um, if a company, right, uh, how much is being owned by the founder. I think it's a very important number. If a founder doesn't have enough stocks, doesn't own enough of the company, it just means that they are less likely to have a, they have a smaller vested interest, right? A founder could potentially leave Right, your CEO could potentially leave. If a company is more than 50% controlled by VCs, other investors, your leaders, your C-level management 
may not necessarily be able to make decisions in your interest. You have to figure out if they liquidate, should they liquidate, what will you get out of it? Sometimes, or more than often, you get nothing, right? Uh, 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll go through this um, quickly. Yeah, um, taxation. Yeah, you could sometimes project, like, uh, try, to, try to project, like, over, like, two to four years, how much more salary increase, valuation increase you get in your stocks. Definitely look at all other benefits you'll get. Medical benefits, leave. Um, you know, I've, I've some companies that explicitly advertise that Wednesdays are work from home means you don't have to go to the office. These are all tangible, right? Um, the location, how far you have to travel matters as well. Um, there are many, okay, phone is too small, but if you look it up on your phone or laptop, you know, there are many other things like opinions on the CEO, um, like, other things that you see on Crunchbase or on Glassdoor. Glassdoor is actually a very important resource. These days there's one more um, platform called Blind. It's to basically see what other, other uh, employees um, comment about their company. What's, uh, what's the insider news, right? Negotiation is, important, is an important skill. Many of us don't want to deal with it, but I tell you it's important. It's important because you have spent so much effort interviewing, now you're gonna get an offer, right? Make the most out of it. You will think that the interviewer will drop you at this point in time, but that's false. You have to understand how HR acts. They have spent resources interviewing you. They have flown you into the area or maybe, you know, like give you a cap claim or something, right? They have spent engineering man hours interviewing you. They will not, they are less likely to drop you at this point in time if you ask for more. You have to, any of you play poker? In real life? No? Okay. Playing poker is important. The lessons learned are the same, right? Don't give away your hand. You may have multiple offers. Don't give them away, right? Use them as clues. State you have offers, but don't say what offers you have, okay? You know where you stand. Now, if you are getting your first job, okay, maybe don't negotiate that hard, okay? Maybe you think that, oh, just take it, but you, you have to know your worth. You know your worth only through interviewing multiple times, right? I have a friend who uh, was, got a job offer with a local company, right? I, I look at him, it's like, you know, I, I know that he can easily get, I, I, was, he, I, look, I actually look at his offer, he actually sent me his offer, you know, to review. But I look at it and see like, mm, that feels a bit low, <laughs> right? And then I look at their, I basically look on going on LinkedIn, I CSI their company, more or less, I get a mental model about how the company operates. And I know that, yeah, they can afford more. They can afford more and they're expanding. It means that the company is more desperate than the employee at that point in time. When they are more desperate, it means that they have the money to spend. So what do you do? You ask for more. So there's no shame in asking for more, right? There's no shame testing, testing the boundaries. Professionally, of course, respectfully, you know, propose a counter offer, right? Propose counter offers, ask for, you know, a sign on bonus or propose a different package, compensation package. Many professionals in the industry do this, especially in higher levels, okay? Let me warn you about pressure tactics. Many HR people, they like to use pressure tactics. But it's very common in negotiation. If you don't give a person time, you make a person worried, worried, depressed, anxious. The person will tend to just sign on spot, right? Like, will you buy this insurance scheme? This is a one-off deal, tomorrow discount, no more, <laughs> right? If someone is selling you a discounted item, they tell you this discount is limited, your limited stocks, right? It's common pressure tactics. Don't cave into such pressure tactics. Just don't. Okay, you know you have options. You know you can interview somewhere else, right? You know that they will not drop you at this point in time, okay? What you can do, give a finite timeline. I give a finite timeline of about uh, one month-ish, okay, for me to make a decision. This gives me ample time to make the best decision for myself. And any company who is serious about hiring, about hiring you would give you the time. I mean, besides, there's usually no rush in hiring. There's no rush. Why is there no rush? I mean, potentially they could hire someone else and later tell you, you know, uh, we already got someone else to fill the position. Well, that's usually a small company, right? There's no rush because companies don't move that fast. It's not as though like, 
someone coming in today versus you know, two to four weeks later is going to make a difference. That guy's still going to ramp up. That guy still needs to learn the stack. That guy still needs time to fit in, right? Learning. Very often you think that, oh, yeah, you join a company, you can get productive straight away from day one. That's not true. The older a company is, the more complexity is there in the company's source code. You know, you probably start off fixing bugs, and it's going to take time. There's no reason to rush. Give a finite timeline so that the HR has expectations. You agree on the expectations because if your timeline is too long, the HR has the opportunity at that point in time to tell you, no, we're actually looking for someone to fill in like, in, three week, in three weeks or two weeks. Negotiate. He asked for two weeks, you ask for three. Go back and forth. Try to find a middle ground. Right? They often tell you, yeah, we have many other candidates to consider, blah, blah, blah. It's just a ruse. Yeah, they have many other candidates, sure. But are they going to pick someone? If they pick someone else, it's probably because that person is indeed a better fit, and that's why they choose not to, you know, not to choose like to, to, let, to drop you later at that point. I mean, that's fine. You weigh your own risk, right? If you can afford to wait, you wait. If you can't afford to wait, then don't. Okay? Some people tell you, oh, your package is very, very high. Tell you, industry standard. It's usually a lie. It's usually a lie. Do your own research, right? Do your own research. Talk to people in the industry, right? Ask in, <coughs> ask in Telegram groups, right? About company, what is their average salary? Ask, check on Glassdoor, right? Do your research. You know what is true. Okay, I need to reach the end over here. Um, it has been a very long presentation. Um, so, you know, um, some of you have, have asked me whether, you know, I have my email, I want to you know, just do a chat or something, right? I do help people review CVs from point of time to time. I do refer people to other HR companies, um, you know, for potential roles that I see that fit potentially fit you. Just let me know your goals. Like, remember in the early part today, I tell you, fill in your goals. That's important, right? Um, and if any questions, we can stay to chat later. Yeah, and this QR code is uh, my email. I hope it works. Thank you.